Now, if someone doesn't show, and they're not there at all, Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to our third and final day of this year's technical sessions of the ISS R&D conference. It's great to have you here. And today is our poster presentations day. So I'm Jim Way. I'm executive director of the American Astronautical Society. Uh, I'll be your host for the morning and uh, for the first half of the morning. And then for the second half of the morning, uh, Alan DeLuna, the president of the American Astronautical Society will be your host. So a little bit about it, uh, the Astronautical Society, AAS is a nonprofit technical society founded back in 1954. 
Our mission is to advance all space science and exploration activities. We do that through our well-known symposia like the Goddard Symposium, the Glenn Symposium and the Von Braun Symposium. That one is coming up October 12 through 14. So please look for that on our website. Uh, we also have amazing technical conferences like our Astrodynamic Specialist Conference, our Space Flight Mechanics Meeting, our Guidance Navigation and Control Conference. And you can find, about, find out about all of those on our website at astronautical.org. We also partner with the folks at ISS National Labs or CASIS on this conference. And we lead the effort on these technical sessions while uh, their main focus is the plenary sessions, which we went through uh, about a couple weeks ago. Uh, so please do make sure to connect with us on social media. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram, on Twitter and Facebook. And we also have a LinkedIn group out there, by the way. Um, and finally, thank you to our sponsors. Uh, without them, uh, none of this could happen, especially the Boeing Company, this year's ISS R&D Platinum sponsor, um, as they, they've been the sponsor, the Platinum sponsor for at least the previous nine years and have been a huge supporter of the event. So we thank Boeing very, very much. Uh, and thanks to our silver sponsors, Airbus, KBR, Lidos, Northrop Grumman, Sierra Space, Space Tango, Teledyne Brown Engineering, the Engineering and Innovative Technology Development Team at the University of Alabama, and thanks to our exhibitors, Jacobs, Oceaneering, and TechShot. All right, so more about the poster day. So our posters are 10 minute blocks. Uh, so it's a five minute recorded presentation and then five minutes of live Q&A with the poster authors. Uh, we have authors of all types uh, and they're really uh, looking forward to getting audience questions and really wanna talk more about their work. So please don't hesitate to jump in and, uh, and engage with us. Uh, with that, uh, let's get started with our first uh, poster presentation. This one is uh, called Project Infinity, a by youth for youth nonprofit initiative aimed to increase awareness of ISS research. And forgive me if I mispronounce, but uh, the author is Parisa Ashar. And uh, we will run that slot, that poster now. Hello, my name is Parisa Asher, and I'm the executive director and co-founder of the 78 nonprofit and our Project Infinity initiative. Four years ago, we started STEMNATE to make STEM education more accessible to students from various socioeconomic backgrounds. Our outreach within STEMNATE accelerated when we led a petition and spoke at various local education board meetings to continue funding to save our local math science innovation center, which was one of less than 100 locations worldwide that hosted the interactive Challenger Space Center program, which allowed students to work as various NASA related occupations such as space medics or engineers to brainstorm various methods to dock on the ISS or Mars and decide on which specific research to be performed in a simulated setting. Project Infinity was launched as an initiative under our 78 nonprofit with a specific focus on space related sciences, engineering and medicine, especially after statistics showed how women accounted for only 23% of science and engineering occupations at NASA. Ever since, we've hosted both in-person and virtual STEM education workshops via both STEMNATE and Project Infinity. Our first virtual camp during the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic was our Train Your Brain camp, which included STEM lessons on a variety of topics, all integral to many space-related missions or careers, including but not limited to cell division, the human anatomy, formation of stars, the Big Bang Theory, black holes, and various NASA spacecraft that have been sent to various planets and moons within our solar system, such as the Voyager 2 mission with Uranus. Specifically essential to our Project Infinity initiative, I was involved with the implementation of teaching the Mars Base Camp curriculum developed by the National Voyage Organization. I delivered four sessions of teaching elementary school students how to use Scratch programming to code various sprite characters like an astronaut and rover communicating with each other in a simulated environment on the Mars terrain. During this past summer, we hosted and helped lead a socially distanced camp titled Mission STEM, where I taught students the effects of microgravity on astronaut health, the functions and importance of the ISS in microgravity research, creation of microgravity via free fall state, changes of water properties like cohesion and surface tension in microgravity, and Newtonian physics of why satellites like the ISS are able to orbit Earth constantly. 
Using serial and clothespins, students conducted hands-on experiments to learn about bone density and muscle mass alterations occurring in astronauts and microgravity. Additionally, students conducted experiments developed by the Dream Up curriculum, such as the density and space activity and the leaky water bottle activity, where students specifically learned how astronauts are able to stay enclosed in the ISS during a continuous state of freefall. Students also investigated the effects of water's unique properties with and without gravity by performing experiments in the classroom and comparing the results to astronauts who performed similar demonstrations on the ISS. During the pandemic lockdown last year, we performed these same demonstrations with students also virtually and also introduced these students to have the opportunity to see images of the Earth taken from astronauts aboard the ISS via the Sally Ride Earth Cam program. Throughout this mission STEM camp with 4-H, I also helped volunteer with or lead many other activities developed by the National 4-H Mars-based curriculum, including building a mock Mars rover with screws and Legos, building rockets that launched, and learning about the geographical terrain on Mars. A unique sample of our Project Infinity initiative is our annual STEM and Space Symposium. During our first symposium, we invited guest speakers to respectively discuss their work with bones and the loss, experiments conducted in simulated microgravity, internship work on high altitude balloon experiments at the NASA Ames Research Center, a winning proposal in the National Genes and Space Competition on drug metabolism and liver cells, as well as work with legumes and microgravity as part of the ExoLab mission. For a second STEM and Space Symposium this past month, we invited renowned speakers, including flight surgeon, Dr. Sean Kevin Rhodes, who was previously head of the medical operations of the ISS, Scientist Dr. Rahul Goel, employed through San Jose University on a contract basis with NASA Ames Research Center, and Dr. Christina Johnson, a fellow in NASA's postdoctoral fellow program at the Kennedy Space Center, who discussed their work on changes in astronaut anatomy and microgravity, neurophysiology and microgravity, and developing specialized microgreens for astronauts in space on long duration space voyages. Additionally, our Project Infinity Executive Director, me, Parisa Asher, was recognized as an honorable mention recipient in the National 2021 Genes in Space Competition for my proposal on kidney function, alterations, and changes in osteopontin and microgravity. Likewise, we have developed PowerPoints teaching students how to brainstorm a scientific experiment that could be conducted on the ISS and write an organized proposal based on criteria from the Genes in Space Competition. Okay, fantastic. Uh, very cool stuff. Um, uh, Parisa, if you're still, yeah, there you are. If you could bring yourself up. Hi, how are you? Good uh, morning. I'm doing well. How are you? Great. Thank you. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, so uh, if anybody has any questions uh, for Parisa, please go ahead and post them in the Q&A tool. Um, in the meantime, I've got a couple of my own. So um, how did you build awareness uh, uh, of everything you were doing, you know, beyond, you know, your immediate community? Um, uh, so that's a great question, because especially where I'm from Richmond, there's not a centralized sort of curriculum for space enrichment and the International Space Station, and um, also many likewise uh, related activities. So I first started out a bit broad just through my parent organization, STEMINI, just to increase awareness of just STEM fundamentals, because a lot of those concepts are extremely fundamental anyway for space-related missions. And then after that, it was easier to then focus on a specific initiative now toward, like curating towards space and the ISS. And so once these students were already comfortable with these STEM fundamental topics, they were able to advance. A prominent example is like this past summer, we, uh, uh, or rather spring, we hosted a human anatomy camp. And then likewise for a STEM and space summit, when a flight surgeon was invited to talk, many of the students were already affiliated with a lot of key terms on um, like the vestibular system. And then in essence, how changes in microgravity affected those um, human anatomies or physiologies. Wow, very cool. Uh, okay, so we do have a question from the audience. Uh, let me read this first. Wow, okay, this is a pretty detailed question. Uh, you, oh, you can probably read it too. Uh, so what about your, uh, um, what about concepts like, do you do, I don't know anything about this, plasma cosmology, um, Dr. Eric Lerner, did, is, that, is that familiar to you? Um, I personally, myself, am not very familiar no, with either. the subject, 
So I do apologize in advance, but I will add that um, one thing on our uh, Project Infinity Initiative Advisory Board team is that we have uh, youth board members who are involved in different aspects of space. I myself am involved more with the biology or biomedical engineering experiments involved in the ISS. The other co-founder, Cody Brogan, who you may have seen in the poster, is more involved with like some of the satellite missions that have gone out to space and then also looking at more physical sciences. And the third one is looking more at bioinformatics rather and then data that's sent from the ISS back to Earth. So, I mean, we're exploring, um, sorry, I apologize. We're exploring, I guess, um, a broader initiative of the ISS, if that makes sense, and because it's very vast. And hence, we now want to make more organized tracks within the initiative so that it can be like a set specific um, curriculum. Gotcha. So, so people can just focus on their biology. They can focus on the engineering. They can focus on human health, that kind of thing. Yes. Got it. Makes a lot of sense. Good. And uh, what kind of support, you, you know, you talked about the Jeets in Space program, uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a really accomplished and, and pretty well-known program. Um, what other kinds of support have you received along the way to help you, you know, build this out? Of course. So we just recently became a 501c3 not a certified nonprofit through our official STEMINATE organization. So we've used a lot of that to host many of our summits for Project Infinity, the initiative under, uh, within. Um, so we've relied also on the Dream Up and the NASA uh, demonstrations curriculum um, for middle and high school students as well, or to inspire like-minded experiments. But in terms of funding, I would like to extend a huge amount of gratitude to the Prudential Foundation through their Community of Service Awards program. We were recognized as a distinguished finalist, as well as um, musician Nile Rogers um, from the Three Dot Dash Foundation, who gave us a uh, who recognized our space outreach efforts, um, especially with the last year's ISS conference. And we've been able to get not just more like financial support, but recognition. And in essence, it's like a positive feedback loop. It only helps us further initiative to more youth. Right, great. And so how, how, are you, how are we spreading this to other schools? How are you doing that? You know, how are you reaching out, you know, either domestically, internationally? Of course. So we actually are an international based um, nonprofit. And the reason why is that um, through many like science fairs or other, I would say symposiums, we've been able to establish connections. And we use a lot of, I wouldn't say digital marketing, but like um, social media through to first establish points of contact, um, mm -hmm. particularly university students. That's our main target for establishing these chapters. Um, and from there, we kind of are now trying, like we have developed PowerPoints. And so we now just share the content curriculum, which then they can just reshare or teach or develop further in their unique way to students within their home countries as well. Um, in fact, uh, one of our future goals was that the United Nations, they have a um, program called Space for Women um, per the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. And um, a lot of their work is actually more focused um, on, you know, uh, kind of developing this sort of peaceful and maintaining this sort of cooperative relationship internationally, since the ISIS is used by many countries worldwide. So we want to also highlight that as a focus to get more international youth involved. Like many people seem to forget that it's a very collaborative effort than what it seems like. Yeah, yeah, very good. Very good. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have right now. But uh, what I'm going to say to you and to all the other poster presenters is if we don't get to a question uh, in the Q&A thing, uh, in the Q&A block, we're going to leave them up there and the, the poster authors, presenters can go in there and answer them themselves. Don't do it while we're live. So we actually have something to talk about. Uh, but uh, um, please do. Um, go ahead in and answer those questions. Uh, I wanna make sure I'm still coming through live because it looks like Parisa froze. Um, all right, so with that, uh, Parisa, thank you so much for uh, your poster. And we're gonna go, uh, if my team is ready, we're gonna go right into our next poster. We're gonna play a little bit of catch up, you know, with my introductions, I went a little long, uh, but our next poster is new comprehensive capacity building measures through the CubeSat deployment from ISS Kibo, and our author is Yasuko Shibano. So let's roll that poster. Thank you very much for coming today. 
My name is Yasuko Shibano from Jackson. First of all, I would like to introduce about James Small Satellite Orbital Deployer called JSOD and achievement for capacity building through the CubeSat deployment from Kibo. The JSOD is one of the unique systems in Kibo exposed facility and can deploy CubeSats and microsats into the orbit from Kibo. The developed CubeSats are set on JSOD case and transported to the ISS specialized area. An astronaut mounts the JSOD case on the experimental platform and then is carried out of the ISS through the airlock. And then the robot arm carries it to the deployment position and satellite will be deployed. 54 satellites have been successfully deployed so far. Since this year, we have also started to operate JSOT-R, which can be used repeatedly and deployed maximum 6U in one slot. JAXA has provided the opportunities of satellite deployment to various countries as a gateway for sharing the values of Kibo, as well as to Japanese universities for the purpose of enhancing satellite development and operation technologies. One is the Cable Cube program with the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs to provide deployment opportunities to space emerging countries. The other, JAXA provide deployment opportunities to domestic universities. As shown on the map, 17 countries use deployment opportunities and 38 satellites were deployed by JSOD. In order to encourage the capacity building, JAXA is going to launch the following activities. The first is the extension of the Kibo Cube program. JAXA and UNUSA agreed to extend the Kibo Cube program to 2024 and add the two rounds. The seventh round application just opened at the UNUSA website and the application deadline is the end of December. We are looking forward to receiving your applications. Secondly, JAXA will launch the new fee-based satellite deployment initiative, which is called JCube program. JAXA provide continuous satellite deployment opportunities for the space emerging countries for more challenging and advanced missions. Japanese universities has also a chance to deploy more technologically ambitious satellites. In order to implement this program more effectively, JAXA signed an agreement with University Space Engineering Consortium. The detailed application procedure of JCube is under preparation and will be announced on JAXA's website as soon as it's ready. The third is Kibo Cube Academy. JAXA and UNIUSA shared the understanding that the satellite deployment itself is important, but also, more importantly, that increasing their abilities from the satellite de development, its operations, and the data utilization, as well as the project management and system engineering. In order to enhance opportunities for these educational aspects, we are preparing a series of online video lectures, interactive online lectures, and technical consultation. Four online lectures were held in January and February, and they are uploaded on YouTube. So to summarize, we are continue to provide not only the satellite deployment opportunity, but also combining the educational aspects for the space emerging countries and the Japanese universities. JAXA, in collaboration with UNUSA and UNICEF, continuously work to maximize the outcome of the ISS Kibo utilization. Thank you for your attention. 
Excellent, excellent poster. Very uh, interesting technology and uh, development. Uh, Yasuko Shibano, good morning, good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Hello, welcome. Uh, excellent poster. So again, if anybody has any questions, uh for our presenter uh please feel free to post them uh at this time uh in the meantime um maybe you can tell me uh, a little bit more about I, I you talked about the academy uh and and the videos available to everybody uh maybe you can talk a little bit more about that yeah so i explained the more detail about the uh, keyboard cube academy so uh, the lecture the lecturers uh, technical course uh, to learn the basic uh, basics of satellite deployment and operation. Uh, you uh, you will be uh, introduced to a mission ex example uh, using uh, CubeSat and uh, learn basic uh, information about uh, how satellites are designed and uh, how development tests are conducted and how satellites are operated. Uh, in addition, uh, we plan to provide lectures for uh, project management method are necessary to develop a uh, satellite. So I, I expect that uh, this will be a very good uh, collection of uh, lectures for beginners. Uh, furthermore, uh, we plan the uh, interactive events uh, with a Q&A corner uh, where uh, you can chat uh, with the lectures. Uh, lecturers uh, and a uh, consultation to answer a specific question. Uh, uh, in addition, uh, the four day uh, course uh, Kibo Cube Academy uh, in January to February uh, of this year has already been uh, made public. So I think uh, it uh, would be a good idea to take a look at them uh, for uh, uh, test drive. So I also learned a lot from it. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, that sounds like a great resource for anybody, even small with a tiny interest in CubeSats, but uh, for anybody looking to do it. So we do have a good couple of questions coming in uh, from the audience. Um, have there been any CubeSat projects uh, looking at uh, material buildup on electrified surfaces? So I'm assuming that an electrified surface can attract uh, various debris. Have you seen anybody looking to test that? Uh, maybe. Uh, unfortunately, I I I couldn't uh, the these missions. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's but, fine. Uh, uh, maybe uh, you, you can try uh, the new uh, missions uh, in the J uh, JSOD, uh, uh, using by using uh, JSOD. Got it. Very good. Um, so, the what about the the, the cost uh, of of CubeSats? Do you, as you're doing this, uh, are you seeing low uh, the the cost to deploy CubeSats decreasing? Is is that something that uh, JAXA is bringing to the market by doing this? Uh, uh, you mean the uh, deployment cost? Mm hmm. A deployment cost, okay. So a uh, CubeSat program is a uh, free, a uh, free. Uh, but the JCube me a uh, program uh, is a uh, few based uh, satellite deployment initiative. So uh, uh, you uh, the a uh, team uh, prepare the cost for deployment. Okay, okay, very good. Um, and uh, how long? does it normally take for a CubeSat to go from a proposal to actual flight? Uh, what, what, you know, how long does that generally take? Uh, a skid, uh, the operation schedule, so what you mean? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, yeah. the normally, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the, so, uh, for the J JQ, uh, for mm -hmm. the uh, JQ, so uh, the few months are selection time, and and then that we uh, we will uh, have the kickoff meeting, and then the the development is uh, will be starting, and uh, development and testing 
it will be take uh, out one or more. And then the, uh, the uh, we are launch the rocket and and then the uh, uh, the satellite uh, will be deployed. So maybe uh, you will take uh, one point five year uh, from one point year to uh, two years for okay. uh, yeah uh, between the uh, selection to uh, deployment. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you. Um, there are a couple more questions. Um, if you feel like you want to, you can uh, go into the Q&A tool and uh, answer them yourself. Uh, it's a question on um, uh, local universities and, and also um, what type of work are emerging countries doing with the CubeSat program. So if you want to go in and answer those, you can. Uh, there, uh, and then there's also uh, a question on how many uh, uh, CubeSats have you all deployed so far. So. We don't, unfortunately, we don't have time right now to answer those questions, but you can jump in there and answer them yourself. So, uh, Yasuko, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate it. And uh, we're going to move on to our next poster. So, thank you. Um, thank you. All right. Our next poster um, is called Growing an Industry Astro Culture in the Age of Artemis. And this poster author is Mark Ciotola, I think is how it's pronounced. So let's run that poster. Astral culture is a growing field, literally. There is an increasing quantity of producers and potentially more customers. With new players and new uses, the astral culture industry may be evolving in nature. This presentation examines the potential evolution of the astroculture industry. The current astroculture industry is composed of several types of producers. The industry producers chiefly include hardware fabricators, research institutions, integrators, and launch services. Presently on the consumption side, there are chiefly the large space agencies. This presentation will focus on the US astroculture industry. By far the largest consumer is NASA, Ultimately, pays for consumes nearly all the research work, hardware fabrication, and a tiny bit of food growth for astronaut consumption. In economics, when a single customer dominates an industry, it is called monopsony. Astroculture is currently a monopsony, with NASA being substantially the only customer via direct expenditures and other subsidies, such as cases subsidies. There's a tiny bit of commercially funded research and numerous STEM products, but these are dwarfed by NASA's consumption. Past business research has provided us with tools to analyze industries. One such tool, Porter's Five Forces, provides a model for influences on industry profitability. There are five constituent influences, new entrants, substitutes, buyer power, seller power, and competitive rivalry. Let's apply Porter analysis to the industry segment of fabricating hardware, such as plant growth chambers for use in space. As mentioned, the astroculture industry is a monopsony where NASA is by far the largest customer. Therefore, bargaining power of the buyer is somewhat high. There are multiple hardware suppliers in this industry, but not many and the hardware is fairly specialized. Seller bargaining power is moderate. There are not many substitutes, so the threat of substitute products is low. Likewise, although many parties talk about entry, barriers are somewhat high, so the threat of new entrants is moderately low, although a few researchers do build their own flight hardware. Since buyer power is somewhat mitigated by seller power and other factors are neutral, competitive rivalry is significant, but moderate. Here we see a representation of the physical ecosystem of the astroculture industry. Though not every project works this way, enough of them do, so this is a reasonable representation. The nexus of a research project is typically NASA or a research institution. We see that the inputs required to make an agricultural product happen. Botanists develop research experiments, 
and develop expertise. Hardware vendors develop plant growth chambers and other biotechnology equipment. Space integrators, also called implementation partners, fit the project into the larger envelope of spacecraft systems. The launch services deliver the product, project hardware, and material as a payload to the space station. This industry has enough size and complexity to be, in a sense, a web or network of relationships. But it's a fairly competitive business between integrators. Here, the funding system is shown. Money formally moves from a space agency, such as NASA, to a research institute. The institute may then pay a hardware vendor for a customer's hardware or access to existing hardware. The institute may also pay an integrator who then pays a launch service. However, what makes much of this work possible and affordable is that NASA often subsidizes launch costs. The commercial funding ecosystem is comprised of many of the same entities. A difference is that there are investors who might not contribute anything physical. The nexus of the project here is a private company. By private, it's meant not government or nonprofit. It could be a privately or publicly owned company. As the quality and volume of the space sector increase, the industry will no longer be a NASA monopsony. Increased volume should mean increased economies of scale. Less reliance on NASA means increased financial stability of business levels. It's no longer dependent upon the ups and downs of congressional funding. As an increasing amount of people live in space, there will be greater demand for food grown in space. A greater proportion of the agriculture industry will be devoted to food protection versus research, yet research demand may grow due to greater demand for new and improved varieties of plants. Okay, sorry about that. Sometimes I just don't know when these are gonna end, uh, but uh, uh, very cool stuff. Uh, sounds like a, a, an interesting analysis of, you know, the kind of the commercial um, applications uh, for astroculture. So um, if we could bring up uh, Mark, uh, if you could come up on screen, please. Hello. Hi, Mark. How are you? Good. 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 So yeah, very interesting stuff. Uh, so if anybody has questions, please do post them. Uh, and actually there is one already. Um, so uh, this is from Bill. Uh, do you regard NASA as a monopsonist uh, for the purchase of non-chemical propulsion? Uh, I, I don't know if this applies to your presentation, uh, like ion drive and nuclear thermal. Um, are, are they still in that same uh, uh, monopsonist position? Uh, that's a good question. There are uh, private parties working on it. Um, some of them are privately funded. I don't know if anyone's provo uh, I'm not really sure because I I'm not an expert in propulsion, but you often have them going to other companies that can choose which technologies they want for propulsion and things like that. And right. then they'll package it together and put it to NASA. So I, I'm not qualified to answer that, but I'm not sure that's a clear cut case of NASA monopsony. Gotcha. Um, so what do you think, you know, the advent of additional commercial platforms uh, becoming available, um, you know, non-NASA LEO platforms coming available will do to this market? Um, right now, much of the market for, for instance, space plant ch chambers, growth chambers, is concentrated um, in one company, Sarah Space. Uh, they're the pioneer in this. Um, and if you need a chamber, you're pretty much going to them. Um, however, they're gonna have their own space station up potentially with their own habitat. So competitors might not want to have to rely on them for the plant growth chambers. So they might have to find other companies to buy those from, or they'll have a big motivation to do so. Um, that'll create competition in the business. Um, there's the expertise out there um, but it's not really well developed often in other firms. This, I think, will it'll either do it in-house or they'll send business to other firms and we'll actually have a little bit of an actual functioning marketplace. Yeah, that'll be interesting when it actually becomes a you know kind of a true functioning marketplace. Um, so what what about you know innovations uh, in you know the actual uh, kind of equipment uh, going up there, you know, there, there's standardization, you know, with, with racks and things like that. But, you know, what about innovation? Um, you know, is there room for that? And how does that work uh, given the, the current makeup of the, in, of the commercial space? 
Um, one thing that's actually restraining uh, innovation in the current environment is NASA is extremely risk adverse. Uh, they don't want anything like a plant may create a bad smell or some of the soil might get loose. So there just might be things that NASA is extremely risk intolerant of that you could have on independent platforms. Um, and that maybe are going overboard with the risk level, but that they'll be able to do. So you'll be able to have a lot of flexibility and freedom to try so many more approaches and add so many more features in private platforms without really increasing the risk very much. So gotcha. tremendous, there should be a tremendous growth in that. Right. Uh, uh, here's a question uh, from James Hitt. How much is the notion of agriculture and industry constrained by or influenced by the notion of a public good? That's an interesting question. Okay, that's a, a really broad question. Um, yeah. Almost a whole uh, discussion, economics and philosophy. I don't know if I'm really prepared to answer that question. My apologies. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I don't know if you can see that next one about um, you know providing an environment similar to Earth for the purpose of formation. Uh, you know, we're talking about future generations in space. Um, I mean, so I guess maybe a, a more focused question is. How will this this your marketplace you know this marketplace and everything influence long duration missions? You know what what's being learned from this that will help help us uh, be have more sustainable long duration missions, longer distance. So um, for robotic missions, maybe not a lot, but if we want to put people into space, it's going to be huge. Um, humans themselves are part of an ecosystem here on Earth, and if you want people to survive in deep space where you can't simply ship food supplies continuously, um, you're going to have to recreate a much bigger piece of the ecosystem, especially the loops between things. For instance, um, we breathe in oxygen, we expel carbon dioxide. Um, plants can then take that carbon dioxide, turn into sugars and expel oxygen. Um, so there's actual multiple things going. So we're exchanging gases, um, potentially exchanging food and nutrients. Uh, and if we don't do that, we're not going to be able to have people in space long term, unless you just freeze them and keep them frozen forever. You know what I mean? If you want living societies, um, you're going to have to solve these problems. So I think there will be a learning curve, um, but also the deployment and implementation of these things is vital. Right. Good. Uh, well, we're out of time. Uh, there is one other question in there from you for you from Bill Gardner. So if you want to jump in and answer that, just uh, type in your answer in the Q&A tool. We welcome you to do that. But Mark, thank you very much for your presentation. Interesting stuff. Sure, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, and on to our next poster. Uh, let's hear about studying nanotechnological solutions against space elicited stress with a space tailored organism. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Uh, the, 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 I've got the wrong one. Uh, simulated deep, sp deep space flight effects on immunity. And our author is Amber Paul. Uh, let's run that poster. Hello, my name is Amber Paul and I'm assistant professor at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. And I'll be talking about my research as a postdoctoral fellow at NASA Ames Research Center. This research focused on immune responses generated in low Earth orbit and beyond. Recently, NASA's Space Radiation Laboratory has successfully developed realistic deep space irradiation dosing schemes that can be measured in ground-based studies. Therefore, we sought to investigate the immediate early immune effects following acute simulated galactic cosmic ray and solar particle event irradiation, singly or in, com in combination with Heinlein unloading in mice. We hypothesized unique immune signatures and microRNA profiles would be produced in each experimental condition. To test this, three-month-old wild-type female mice were normally loaded or Heinlein unloaded for 14 days and irradiated on day 13 with doses described here. Gamma irradiation was used as a gauge to, re to gauge the relative biological effectiveness of GCR and SPE. Mice were weighed on multiple days and blood and plasma were collected on day 14. Leukocytes were isolated from blood and immune differentials were profiled, in addition to gene expression analysis of whole blood. MicroRNA differentials were identified from plasma as they play an important role in gene expression regulation, contribution to immunity, and use for therapeutic purposes. To begin, reduced body and spleen weights were noted in deep space simulations suggesting immunity may be affected. 
while a significant reduction in total leukocyte populations were observed in all irradiation groups, confirming irradiation exposures caused robust impairment to immune status. When we looked at the innate immune system, similarities in SPE and gamma radiation with and without Heinlein unloading were noted, while interestingly no effect of GCR radiation was observed. On a side note, HU alone also increased the number of neutrophils. When we looked at the adaptive immune system, B cell population counts and CD20 expression patterns were altered with deep space simulation suggesting humoral immunity may be impaired. Importantly, deep space simulation completely abolished T lymphocytes, in particular cytotoxic T cells, suggesting post-exposure proliferation may favor T helper lymphocyte predominance. Indeed, a shift to Th2 immunity may occur based on the prominent gene expression induction of IL-4 full change. Further, reduced overall lymphocytes resulted in elevated neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio compared to NL sham controls, suggesting deep space flight may trigger inflammation. Interestingly, HU alone displayed elevated IL-6 production that is consistent with elevated neutrophils, as IL-6 contributes to neutrophil survival. MicroRNA GO and Hallmark terms following deep space simulation revealed reduced spleen and thymus development, B cell differentiation, myeloid cell differentiation, and FCR mediated signaling, suggesting probable phagocytosis impairment. Upregulated DNA repair, apoptosis, and reactive oxygen species pathways were also identified. To characterize inflammation experienced on orbit, we repurposed retrospective data from ISS crew members. IL-1 beta and IL-1 alpha were inconsistently elevated during flight compared to pre-flight, while both returned to pre-flight levels upon return to Earth, suggesting ground readaptation. IGF-1 and IL-1 receptor antagonists were also elevated in flight and returned to pre-flight baseline controls, indicating inhibition of IL-1 alpha and or IL-1 beta. Collectively, these results revealed inflammation occurs in LEO with mechanisms induced to maintain homeostasis. Therefore, similar responses may be experienced beyond LEO. In brief, only a small snippet into the immune response was assessed in the study. Therefore, longitudinal responses and functional consequences are required. Nonetheless, we found distinct immune profiles and microRNA signatures are produced by each irradiation type, singly or in combination with Heinlein loading, that can be used for future programmatic queries. Therefore, countermeasure designs must be tailored to target distinct immune responses that would be experienced on exploratory missions to the lunar surface and Mars. And with that, I would like to thank Dr. Ashton Pesti and all collaborating members for assistance with this project, and to all of my funding agencies, including HRP, Space Biology Program, USRA, and Trish. I'd also like to thank the ISS R&D Steering Committee for allowing me to present today. Thank you. Excellent, Amber, very good. Uh, why don't you come on up on screen? There you are, good morning, how are you? Good morning. Uh, down in Florida? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> um, well, cool, very cool stuff. I wish I could talk intelligently about it, but uh, you know, a lot of that goes right over my head, but you know, I'll, I'll ask you real quick before some other questions come in. So what was the most surprising finding uh, you know, that, that, that you know, you, you came out of this with, you, you looked at it and you said, whoa, how about that? Yeah, the most surprising finding for sure was the effect of the uh, of GCRSP on, on the cytotoxic population of cells, as well as the helper T cell lymphocyte population. So essentially 24 hours you were exposed to those ionizing radiations, those populations were reduced drastically. Um, and that's in, in cosmic irradiation types. Um, so there is, um, there is definitely a need to focus on those cells for future research um, and how those can recover after they've been exposed to those types of cosmic radiations. Excellent. Um, somebody asked about blue marble. Uh, can, can you tell us more about blue marble? What, what exactly it is and what yeah. it's doing? Yeah, Blue Marble, it's an international um, um, research group that's interested in studying all things space. Um, it's essentially a way for contrast, contractors to work at NASA. Um, so it's a, good, uh, it's a good avenue that way. Um, and if they need more information, they can reach out to me directly and I can, I can try to get them involved. Okay, uh, I do have a couple of questions that have come in here. Uh, this one's really good, I think. Um, so what kind of ground-based 
uh, microgravity sim. Do, are, are you doing any ground-based micro microgravity simulation before you fly? You know, is, is, does that help you? Um, so the uh, these studies were done in mice, and the ground-based analog that we used was Heinlein loading in mice. Um, so uh, this was done in singly and in combination with GCR, uh, SPE, and gamma radiation. So we have the results showing the effects of just Heinlein loading on the immune system, as well as in combination with galactic cosmic or solar particle events as well. Gotcha. Okay. And thankfully we have some attendees here that are far more uh, educated on this than I am. Uh, so are you aware of any studies at the NSRL specifically investigating mitochondrial function? Yes, I am aware of that and um, participating in some of that research, actually. Um, for more information, since it's such new information, um, we can talk about that offline for sure. Okay. And, and so what about more in-depth tests, uh, you know, for astronauts specifically? Kind of what are the next steps uh, uh, for something like injuries in space, uh, you know, during a deep, a deep space flight um, mission? Um, you know, circulatory system issues. You know, mm -hmm. what kind of work are, are you being, are, are you considering next to, to try to help uh, address those concerns? So circulatory issues, um, that's not really my field. Uh, essentially in the immune, in the immune field, uh, the next step is sort of addressing how certain countermeasure uh, protocol can work for astronauts and certain things like giving them um, things like antihistamines, changing up those types of regimens that are necessary to keep their immune systems healthy and functioning properly when they're exposed to those types of conditions. Um, that's sort of the next step now. Okay. And do you see, uh, I, do you see feedback from all of this coming back to, to changing, you know, uh, things in the pharma, in the pharma industry, as far as you know, what kind of treatments might be available, uh, not only for deep space, you know, uh, deep space exploration uh, astronauts, but back here on Earth. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely that potential for sure. There seems to be this model of mild chronic inflammation that occurs in yeah. spaceflight, but it, it's very tricky with the immune system because, you know, these exposures, these type of, these stimulations, they're, you're exposed to different things. You're going to generate a different immune response no matter what. So really it is very specific to the type of exposure that is experienced. Um, for example, if this types of radiation were given in a protractive level, that might even give a different type of immune response. And that's sort of the next step of developing um, research in that field a little bit more, strengthening that research a little more. Gotcha. Uh, we've got about one minute left. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to mention or, or, or cover uh, about your work? Um, it's just anything, you know, if you have questions, if you're interested in this topic, I'm currently at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, um, and I, there's, a, there's a site there for you to look me up and get in contact with me, um, and yeah, I'm happy to answer any more questions. Great. Yeah, somebody's asking about the, the blue marble information, uh, but they can look on your uh, poster uh, presentation there and reach out directly and, and to find out more about it. Okay, sounds good. And yeah, just go ahead and email me for sure. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much, Amber. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. All righty. Bye-bye. All right. And so let's go on to our next one, uh, the one that I read about before, but this one is called Studying Nanotechnological Solutions Against Space Elicited Stress with a Space-Tailored Organism. Uh, the author here is Andrea uh, Degolin-Innocenti. Uh, don't know if I got that one right, but let's run that poster. Hello, I am Andrea Degli Innocenti from the Instituto Italiano di Tecnologia. The work I'm going to present is titled Stag Nanotechnological Solutions Against Space Elicited Stress with a Space Tailored Organism. Colleagues from Instituto Italiano di Tecnologia are Nicoletta Di Leo, Carlotta Pucci, Matteo Battaglini and Gianni Ciofani. Other institutions involved are the Politecnico di Milano with Chiara Martinelli, the University of Pisa with uh, Gaetana Gambino, Leonardo Rossi and Alessandra Salvetti, and the University of Sassari, with Giacinta Angelo Stocchino and Renata Manconi. Space imparts different kinds of stressors on both cosmonauts and the, the crops they bring with them. In other words, um, dynamics such as alterations of gravity, excess radiation, and aberration of environmental pressure um, constitute common issues in space. 
a shared component at a molecular level is oxidative stress. Our aim is to test long-lasting nanotechnological antifos using simplistic uh, organisms uh, as a space apt biological models. Specifically, our uh, plan is to use planarian worms. Planarians are already a common platform for degeneration studies as well as for aging and stem cell research. Planarians are small and they can be grown in high number with very uh, simple um, uh, animal facilities. Yet they provide a powerful mean to test biological hypotheses, um, even with dedicated technologies such as RNA interference. Planarians are prone to regenerate. For instance, a single specimen can uh, grow back its head after decapitation. We have been selecting the best um, nanotechnological antioxidant for our study. To do that, we performed cohort experiments in which um, an oxidant chemical insult, TBH, uh, was imparted at different concentrations over several days to planarians and then we would have evaluated the um, live or dead phenotype. To assess the potential um, antioxidant capacity of our formulations, we added uh, nanoparticles to the medium and uh, see whether we could, story short, we can say that uh, tannic acid uh, ion nanoparticles are our antioxidant of choice because they can spare the life of planarians um, over a range of uh, threshold concentration for TBH. Took uh, microgranulated uh, here, for instance, uh, with uh, polydopamine or uh, tannic acid ion nano surface uh, alterations, nor we can find clusters of uh, nanoparticles. Other ways uh, to um, test the antioxidant capabilities of our nanoparticles is to perform bleaching experiments in which uh, planarians are discolored uh, with light uh, in the presence or absence of nanoparticles, protective effects of uh, our nanotechnological preparations. We have been performing also uh, preparatory simulated microgravity experiments that uh, in brief can be uh, for several uh, days under control, cor uh, control control. Our future work, uh, which has been already approved, is to internalize as well as uh, other antioxidant assays, eventually uh, to uh, repeat microgravity experiments with or without uh, nanoparticles, um, in order to perform transcriptomics and uh, proteomics. Uh, other things under evaluation um, are uh, experiments, and specifically in the uh, ISS, or in the Arctic um, Station uh, Concordia, specifically to assess uh, the effects of a reduced environmental pressure. Uh, mm, uh, here is a... Uh, uh, our, uh, uh, the details for our funded project, as well as other previously funded projects. Excellent, thank you. Um, so, um, let's see, Andrea, there you are. Hello, welcome. Don't forget to unmute. Hi, hi, hi everybody. <laughs> I'm in Hello. Italia. Excellent. Hi. Uh, so good, e good afternoon, I suppose. Good afternoon, yes. <laughs> um, so very interesting stuff. So uh, it, it, what, is it tannic acid? Is, is, is that the, 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 the one that you saw working the best? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, let's say that uh, tannic acid is the base of the um, nanoformulation. It is combined with uh, um, ion, and then the, the two together uh, act uh, as a nanotechnological uh, antioxidant. In our case, yes, this is the best preparation we found. Excellent. And actually, actually I, I, if I might add, uh, this is uh, probably, uh, I would say, one of the most promising uh, antioxidants uh, in planarians uh, in, in general. Eh? The, 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 the action we found was quite uh, uh, strong. Okay. And so, forgive me, but you know, this might be simple questions, but. How did you determine that that was a good uh, antioxidant to test? 
Okay, so um, they, of course, you, you have this kind of experiments work, work with a, a, a priori hypothesis. So you, you have to uh, kind of choose your candidates. So you, 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 you start with, with, a, with a list and then you, you actually uh, parse this list by screening uh, um, them uh, with, with uh, um, initially live and dead assays in planarians. And planarians are um, uh, convenient for that because they, uh, they allow for, uh, for an effective uh, um, processing of uh, different uh, molecules. So um, this is a kind of a small scale drug discovery approach. Uh, of course, then you, you, you can move from uh, the, the morphology, so the, the gross phenotype of live versus dead, uh, to more uh, metabolic uh, uh, assays, like uh, uh, first of all, tracking uh, um, the, the destiny of, uh, of uh, antioxidant probes, um, but uh, also you, you can go for a more physical uh, approaches uh, such as uh, EPR. And then also you can uh, uh, evaluate the uh, effects uh, uh, like, like we are about to do um, on the transcriptome and the, the proteome. Uh, you can do it, of course, as a whole or, or again, uh, via um, some uh, pre-chosen uh, genes or, or proteins that you might be after. Okay, excellent. Uh, question from our audience. Uh, do you, uh, this is from Bill Gardner. Do you have a view about the pre-existing systemic oxidative stress load in human beings, making them susceptible to excess injury in spaceflight? Okay, so I, I would say that the, the topic of uh, oxidative stress in space, especially regarding humans, is very broad. Uh, actually, uh, even the, the clear-cut definition of uh, oxidative stress is a, a matter of debate uh, to some extent. But uh, uh, I would say that uh, uh, it is safe to say that uh, um, currently oxidative stress is regarded as uh, one of the main uh, component uh, um, that justify alone uh, several uh, of the effects imparted by the different kind of stressors uh, which are typical of space. For instance, uh, uh, oxidative stress uh, is uh, uh, rampant uh, in, uh, in, um, in unloading, so in, in microgravity, uh, but is also an important component of uh, space radiation. Uh, because when, when, when uh, excessive electromagnetic radiation hits the tissues, uh, what you typically uh, get is that some of the uh, molecules that are hit uh, uh, typically produce uh, reactive oxygen species, and, and this generates uh, uh, kind of a cascade that uh, eventually spreads and, uh, and uh, uh, as I said, justifies alone part of the damage imparted by, by radiations. So, but this is true for, for, for other kinds of stressors as well. Huh? Okay. okay, great. And we have another question. I'm not sure I understand it and hopefully you will. Uh, can another method be discovered for the purpose of analyzing stained yeasts to have a higher survival level? Actually, I'm not sure I understand the question okay. as well. Eh? Okay. So, but uh, um, uh, how do I it read was... the question myself? Uh, yeah, it's well, the last one. Can another, ah, okay. Can another method be discovered for the purpose of analyzing stained yeast? No, no, sorry, I don't okay. get that. So, okay. I don't know. I, I imagine there is some kind of colorimetric reaction uh, associated to, to the buildup of uh, uh, radicals, but I, I don't know anything about that. Right, right. So I asked uh, our previous presenter, and maybe you heard the question, but I'll ask you the same question. So what was the biggest surprise uh, of your work? You know, what, what made you sit back and go, oh, how about that? Okay, okay. So uh, I would say things so far are going according to plan. I would probably, the, the thing that most surprised me is the, is the amount of antioxidant activity that we got uh, by using the uh, tannic acid uh, and nanoparticles. I would say that this is uh, uh, for the time being beyond expectations. So mm -hmm. if you want to talk about surprises, that might be one. Eh? Uh, but uh, of course the last uh, word is gonna uh, come from, uh, from uh, the omics. Eh? So we need to be a, a little bit cautious about that and uh, let's see how things uh, uh, develop. Excellent. All right. Well, I think that just about does it for our time. If anybody has any other questions, uh, 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 Andrea might st uh, still stay online a little bit so you could post them to them. If you do have a question for a specific poster presenter, please put their name at the front of your question so that we can direct it to that right person. But uh, thank you very much. That was excellent. We appreciate it. Bye everybody. All right, take care.
All right, on to our next one. Uh, this one is called Melanization uh, Protects Cryptococcus Neoformans During Round Trip to the International Space Station. And our presenter is Radames Cordero. So let's run that poster if we can. Welcome to our presentation, Melanization Protects Cryptococcus Neoformans During Round Trip to the International Space Station. The inside of the ISS gets approximately 100 times more radiation than Earth's soil. Overexposure to this radiation can be harmful to biological systems, particularly ionizing radiation, which can alter the structure and function of biomolecules inside the cell. Radiation in space is a serious concern and protecting biological assets is vital, especially during long duration space missions. If we look at how biology deals with the problem of radiation, we have to talk about pigments like melanin. Melanins are a unique class of polymeric pigments observed throughout the biosphere. Among their many biological functions, melanin acts as a natural sunscreen, protecting animals, plants, and microorganisms from the ionizing effects of ultraviolet sun rays. Melanin protects in part by interacting with radiation and dissipating the absorbed energy as heat. Melanin also protects by neutralizing reactive oxygen species. In fungi, melanin is associated with radio protection against UV, X-rays, gamma rays, and particulate radiation exposure. In 2019, we had the opportunity to fly melanized and non-melanized colonies of Cryptococcus neoformans to the ISS. Cryptococcus neoformans is an environmental yeast-like fungus and is a good model for studying melanin biology since you can create melanized and non-melanized clones by growing the fungus in the presence or absence of a melanin precursor like dopamine. Figure one shows a picture of these colonies. We grew both melanized and non-melanized cells as lawns or biofilms on agar and placed them inside a mix stick, which is a hollow plastic tube that can be compartmentalized as seen in figure two. We prepared two identical samples, one that was sent to the ISS and a second that stayed in the laboratory at room temperature. The samples flew aboard the SpaceX CRS-20 and remained inside the ISS for 29 days before returning to Earth. Upon return, we compared their survival by counting the number of viable cells capable of forming colonies on fresh agar plates. As you can see in figure three, while we do not see a difference in the colony forming of earthbound samples, when comparing the samples exposed to the ISS, the viability of melanized cryptococcus is approximately 50% greater than non-melanized clones. It is important to note that radio protection is not the only way melanin can protect, as melanization is also associated with a resistance to a variety of physical or chemical stressors, including osmotic pressure, heat, and cold stress. We also looked at cells under a light microscope and noted that exposure to the ISS environment is associated with an increase in cell size as seen in figure three. We believe this is an interesting observation, as in bacteria, the opposite occurs, with E. coli tending to shrink in the ISS. Microgravity is likely relevant here, and it will be interesting to address this in future work. Results of this preliminary work suggest that in Cryptococcus, melanization is associated with higher survival following 29 days inside the ISS which is consistent with the known protective role of fungal melanin. We will be happy to answer any questions you may have, and please feel free to reach out to us via email. Thank you. Excellent. And uh, there is, is it Dr. Cordero, Mr. Cordero? Yes, yes, sir. Excellent. Hi, hi Jim. Hi. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Um, so yeah, very interesting stuff. So. Um, this again, I wish I had more uh, knowledge on, on this on this subject. But uh, so if uh, if our attendees could post questions, that'd be great. 
Um, but, the, and this isn't related to the science necessarily, but can you tell me about the, the, the process of getting your experiments to space? Um, you know, it, document, I, we heard uh, in previous things about documentation and, uh, you know, the nano racks and, and the mix sticks and things like that. You know, what, what, was there anything, you know, that was a big roadblock for you or, or a big challenge for you just getting to space? Um, I think that the, the it, we actually collaborated and this was a, an effort from uh, several, several individuals uh, we collaborate directly with. Um, members in Space Center Houston, NanoRacks, and in our laboratory. So it was a, 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 a coordination from, a, from uh, by a lot of people. Uh, nano, the, the assistance that we got and the information that we got was excellent to prepare this. Uh, I think that the major constraint is just it's time. Everything has to work uh, at to a, uh, precisely so to meet the deadlines and the, the time scales of, of the experiments. Uh, so that's, you often have to do plan A, plan B, plan C, uh, and make sure that at the day that you need to send those samples, you will have, some, you will have something ready. So I think that that's probably one of the biggest challenges is just okay. having extra caution in, in getting everything done. Right, right under good. The time. Good. And uh, so again, fortunate to have Bill Gardner in the audience. Uh, he's asking some very informed questions. Uh, how common is melanization of non-fungal organisms? On uh, non-fungal organisms? Well, uh, a, melanin is the most uh, prevalent pigment in animals. Uh, so, uh, so look around you. I mean, we are all covered by this pigment. <laughs> um, so it is, it is highly prevalent. Um, in fungi in particular is, I think we have to stand out the fact that most, if not all fungi have the capacity, uh, have the, the genetic information to produce melanin and they produce different types of melanins. Got it. Um, so I've asked the question before, most surprising, you know, aha moment, like, or, or unexpected uh, information that came out of your work? You know, I, I was actually thinking about that <laughs> to, to say it to because I knew that you were going to ask that. Ask that, and then the first thing I thought was, actually, we were pleased to see that melanized, melanized fungi, uh, the melanized clones, survive better uh, than the non-melanized uh, uh, clones. But this was kind of expected based on the <laughs> the uh, the the vast uh, amount of literature associating melanization with radio protection. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it was just pleased to see that the work that has been done using UV, X-rays, gamma rays here on Earth, uh, you know, we could extend that uh, uh, in the, in the um, uh, low orbit environment. So, so yes. Good. Uh, so what about this one? Uh, let's see. Can we stain other microbes as well with melanin and test the radiation exposure? Um, and what other microbes have you tested before selecting the one? Great question. Uh, well, yes, I mean, staining other microbes with uh, melanin. Yes, I mean, um, you can add melanin ex ex externally as an exogenous uh, external substrate to the organism, considering that melanin is not is biocompatible. Uh, and uh, also you can modify the organism to produce melanin itself. So, so you can either either depending on the organism, you can stimulate it to produce melanin or engineer an organism to produce melanin if it doesn't have the genetic code. Um, so far at the, in the, at the ISS, our group have only used uh, Cryptococcus neoformans for the other groups around the world that have uh, used other organisms uh, also that are melanotic, uh, uh, Cryomyces antarcticus, uh, Sophiala dermatiridis, uh, and um, Cladosporium, for instance, there are other type of fungal species that have been tested. Um, we have selected Cryptococcus neoformans because we are we have been studying this organism for a while. I, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so so next steps. What, I mean, what would what would you want to do next on this one? I think the, the important and exciting thing about this is that uh, we may have. Uh, we, we could consider, for instance, uh, the fact that melanin protects against radiation and different types of radiation prompts the question of whether can we use uh, uh, melanins uh, inspired 
inspired by melanin biology and use melanin as actually as a biomaterial to protect against radiation, increase mm -hmm. the toolbox, right? So we have metals, different plastics, but what about biomaterials? Yeah. Can we do that? And the benefit of, of using biomaterials is that, as you can imagine, you only need one cell, you can produce this at large scales of planets. So I think that biology and biomaterial has, uh, uh, can inspire other solutions for the problem of radiation in space. Gotcha, yeah, because uh, yesterday in one of the sessions we were talking about, you know, vests, you know, wearing, uh, you know, heavy vests and things like that and the bulkiness and uncomfortable uh, aspect of it. And, you know, to, to be able to do it biologically <laughs> might be might be of great benefit. Uh, so that answered Ivan's question about would melanin supplements be beneficial to humans in space, I think. Um, and I think that's what you're looking at, right? Yes, that's actually a yeah. very interesting uh, question, Ivan. And in fact, uh, studies have been done in, in, by oral administration to mice that has received radiation exposure, their gut is protected um, from the ionizing effects of radiation. So as an oral supplement or as an external radio protectant, uh, melanin as a, as, bio, as a biocompatible molecule or polymer could, could provide an alternative. So interesting. Great. Well, Rodamus, there are a couple of other questions in the Q&A thing there for you. If you want to go in and uh, just type in your answer, uh, that'd be great. Uh, you can stay in as a panelist until you do that, um, but that'd be excellent. Uh, so thank you very much for being here. That was really interesting stuff. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Jim. All right. Take care. All right. And uh, we're a little bit behind schedule, but that's okay. We're getting some great stuff here. So let's go on to our next uh, poster. Uh, this one is new one-stop protein crystal growth service for drug discovery utilizing ISS Kibo as a sole private partner with JAXA. And this is uh, Shun Yamaguchi. So let's roll that poster, please. Morning, afternoon, and evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure that you are watching my post presentation today. I'm Shun Yamaguchi from Space BD and responsible for our solution service for primary drug discovery using space experiments. Today, I'd like to talk about the poster title says, our new one-stop protein crystal growth service for drug discovery, utilizing IS keyboard as a sole appointed private partner with JAXA. I have divided this presentation into three sections, as you may know from the poster structure. Firstly, I'll explain the history and the results of our service. Secondly, I'll highlight the uniqueness of our service, and lastly, I'd add how we space really bring new values to our service as an exclusive private partner of JAXA. Firstly, the history and the results of our service. Our official partner, JAXA, has performed high-quality protein crystal growth experiments on ISS for over 10 years and for over 1,000 proteins with hands-on support to users, unique hardware, and methodology development. So, of course, there have been a lot of successful cases produced so far. I have just picked three sample cases as put in the poster. These are all considered to provide useful insight for novel molecular design, screening, and even moving the phase from drug discovery to animal experiment or forward, thanks to high quality protein crystals growing in space. For further publication and results, you can go to JAXA's website as indicated. Secondly, the uniqueness and the strength of our service. What we cover by our service are not only space experiments, but also grand experiments and analyses to fully commit to customer success. And those are handled by our life science PhD expert team who are dedicated to this service for over 10 years with professional quality. For example, as protein engineering experts, we can start by helping crystallization on the ground for those who have difficulty in it. This would totally differentiate us from other space launching players. Lastly, new introduction to our service. We, Space Beauty, as a professional business development company, accelerate the development and global expansion of this service with its official partner, JAXA. There are three things specifically. One, flexible pricing and contracts. Two, 
a friendly user interface system, and three, further technology development with JAXA. In terms of flexible pricing and contracts, and a user-friendly interface system, please check the details on the poster. What we'd like to highlight here is a further technology development cooperation with JAXA. While JAXA supports SpaceBee to run this PCG business on our own, they focus and continue technology development of this service, discussing how we can benefit our customers more. The one JAXA is currently working on is Freeze Soul method. With this new technology, we can keep sample proteins frozen till right before the crystallization starts in ISS. We are hoping to be able to target unstable membrane proteins for space experiments as well. To sum up, we deliver not only space experiment opportunities, but also hands-on ground experiments analyses, as well as comfortable business and operational workflow pricing user interface to fully support and enhance your drug discovery work. For further information, you may contact us by the below email address or go to our life science website. Thanks for, thanks for watching and hope to see you in Q&A sessions. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Yamaguchi-san. Hi, sorry, I moved out my we hear you and we see you. Oh, there yeah. you go. No, you're oh, fine. Hey. Hi. Hi. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, we're going to look for some questions here. So um, somebody is asking just about you know the price uh, of ten thousand mm -hmm. US dollars. So what what is included uh with that ten thousand dollar price if, if you could talk more about that all right so this includes of course a launch to the space definitely mm -hmm. and also the ground experiment support so like we will optimize and improve the sample quality i mean the quality of protein so that you can increase the rate of success through space experiment. Okay. So those are all included. And why publicity is not a requirement? Well, I mean, this is for commercial use. I mean, not necessarily commercial use, but we assume some customers are the commercial customer, especially mm -hmm. pharmaceutical companies. So of course they don't wanna disclose they are like development information. So we put that like non-publicity would be the key benefit for them. Okay, excellent, thank you. So um, do you see bringing on additional partners uh, other than just Space BD? Do you, do you look, do, are you looking to add additional partners to this? Yeah, of course. So from user point of view, we are open to basically everyone. We expect like drug discovery industry companies, like pharmaceutical companies to join us. But of course, uh, university and those research institutes as well. And not only the users, but also suppliers. Like we provide not only specific experiment, but also grand experiment. So like those uh, players, who like offers an R and D support to a drug discovery industry? So we are very okay. open to them. Excellent. Um, what about other? So you've been uh, focused on uh, PCG protein crystal yeah. growth. Mm -hmm. um, are you looking to do other uh, experiments, uh, you know, other science beyond PCG with this with this business model? Mm -hmm. Well, for the moment, we have no specific and fixed plan, but yeah, with this um, knowledge and hardware we are using for PCG. I mean, PCG stands for 
protein crystallization. Mm -hmm. but, so we don't only target the protein itself, but also the protein um, ligand complex, let's say not only the protein itself, but the protein with, uh, let's say, drug candidate. That's also the things we are offering. Okay, great. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please post them to the question and answer uh, tool. Um, but in the meantime, um, you know, you may have heard me ask the others, uh, what, what was the most surprising, uh, uh, you know, aspect of this that you found? Was it, uh, you know, demand from others? Was it uh, the science itself? You know, what kind of made you say, oh, wow, I didn't expect that? <laughs> mm. Good question. And actually, I'm ready for that. Then the most surprising thing is that the results of the space expand, experiment itself. So they mentioned, and there have been, there have been a lot of ex successful cases. And that these are not only for, like, from science, ex science perspective, but also industry perspective. For example, and the drug candidate we tested in ISS has passed and those drug discovery phases and moved to a clinical phases. So we are hoping to, like we are hoping that those drug candidates will be in the market soon by the pharmaceutical company. So they are in the industry, they, I mean, phase and yeah, also the effort our partner JAXA Space Agency in Japan has been putting in this service. So they are space agency, but they have developed those hardware for themselves, like having biologists on, the, on their own. So that's also um, contribute, that also contributed to the success of those um, industry support. Okay. Excellent. Um, anything else? Uh, well, I think we're about out of time, uh, unfortunately, but thank you very, very much for your presentation. It was excellent. Mm -hmm. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. And if anybody has any other questions, uh, please do post them in the Q&A and uh, we can keep an eye on that. Uh, okay. So, um, Unfortunately, our next poster, uh, Space Weather Studies Proposal for the International Space Station, Space Station. Um, unfortunately, our presenter is having some um, uh, power outage uh, problems, uh, Kashia Santos. Um, so we are not going to run that poster. So what we're going to do now is we're going to just take a, a short break, uh, probably about five or 10 minutes. Um, so uh, we're gonna just put up a slide here uh, to show you what's coming up next. Uh, our next poster will be, we'll maybe try to get back on time a little bit. Uh, so why don't we say 10.30, so we're about 10 minutes late. We'll, we'll start up with uh, Ivan uh, Petiev's poster on uh, peripheral tissue oxygenation. So we'll be back in about, uh, let's say about five minutes. Thanks everybody, stand by.
Okay, hi again, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started here in a minute, but uh, Ivan, Ivan Petiev, uh, if you're out there and hearing us, please accept the invitation to join as a panelist so we can have you on for your poster. We need you in as a panelist. Be right back, everybody. Good morning. Hello. Yes, hi, Ivan. Stand by one second. Okay. All right. Welcome back. Uh, I'm going to take one more poster here and then I'll turn it over to Alan, uh, we think. And so, sorry, I'm muting the bridge. Um, all right, so let's get uh, going and uh, try to stay somewhat on schedule with our next uh, poster. This one is called The Effect of Spaceflight on Peripheral Tissue Oxygenation in the Human Body. And our presenter is Ivan Petiev. Uh, let's run that poster, please. Good morning or good afternoon. Today, I would like to present our proposal on the study of effect of spaceflight on peripheral tissue oxygenation in the human body. We all know that spaceflight can cause significant challenges and risks to human health. One of the key parameters affecting body metabolic and physiological activity is the level of oxygen supply to peripheral tissues. A disruption may lead to development of tissue hypoxia, which, even on subclinical level, can result in impairment or in decline of important body functions. Since there is no knowledge about possible effects of spaceflight and its environment on peripheral tissue ocean supply, we would like to propose a study to assess and monitor this parameter in crew members of the International Space Station before, during and after their space expeditions. What is the rationale and the clinical evidence we have behind our proposal? It has been demonstrated that plasma lipoproteins can carry a significant amount of oxygen gas. This property is due to the crystalline hydrophobic structure of lipids, which provide a more favorable environment for oxygen solubility than an aqueous medium. Hemoglobin in erythrocytes is a much more superior and, as we know, is a main transporter of oxygen in the blood. However, erythrocytes cannot pass the capillary wall and deliver oxygen themselves to tissue cells. Therefore, plasma lipoproteins may be the only carrier of oxygen in the interstitial fluid. It was demonstrated in clinical studies that the oxygen carrying capacity of lipoproteins, OCCL, could be affected by a number of factors, including inflammatory damage and oxidative stress. Decline in this parameter may result in a reduction of oxygen supply to tissues and depression in their respiration, which together may contribute to the development of tissue hypoxia. In subsequent interventional studies, it was observed that an increase in OCCL resulted in improvement of peripheral tissue oxygen saturation and associated metabolic and physiological parameters. What are the health benefits for the space flights? From our proposal. If changing in reduction of OCCL of the blood of the station crew members should be observed and the analysis provide a link with possible negative changes in their physiological parameters, this would give us a basis for new interventional studies to provide support for and boost off tissue oxygenation in space. For this purpose, safe already developed nutraceutical products could be used which have been clinically validated in different tissue hypoxia terrestrial conditions. The format of the conventional OCCL test has recently been adapted from analyzing venous blood in a conventional laboratory-based format to a faster, simpler and more convenient fingerprint blood drop point of care test. Our team is ready to prepare the necessary number of diagnostic test kits and train it if this proposal were to be accepted. In addition, if results of this study pave the way to further interventional studies, appropriate nutraceutical products could be also be provided by us. Thank you very much for your attention. 
All right, very good. So oxygenation of tissue, very cool. So uh, Ivan, uh, if you would please uh, turn on your camera and you are unmuted, uh, there you are. Hello. Excellent, good to see you, sir. How are you? I'm fine, thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Uh, so yeah, very cool stuff. And so uh, if anybody has any questions uh, for Ivan, please uh, submit them now, um, that'd be great. And so um, I guess I have a question for you. I, I thought I did. Um, so, um, sorry, forgive me, I got distracted uh, trying to think of. So uh, any other di additional thoughts that you wanna provide right off? Uh, you know, what about uh, results of, uh, of your work so far? Yeah, we've been working on different a uh, hypoxic condition, uh, not necessarily in a clinical environment, but people uh, who uh, uh, have preclinical conditions or people who are aging, because we know with the age, our tissue oxygenation decline. And we basically try to work out how we can assess it and how we can help them, basically working on anti-aging kind of program. And this is we develop the test to measure oxygenation and they develop supplements because it cannot give drugs to prevent aging, really, it's give drugs to treat disease. And this is about our approach for a few years. I am a medical doctor, we have a medical team working on the how we prevent aging processes. And there are some obviously extreme conditions where they cause our hypoxia, not necessarily clinical hypoxia when you need to respiration and so on, but preclinical. And this is what I thought this approach can be used for this uh, space flights, because as you very well know that space flight is accelerating aging. A lot of parameters like a skeleton bone mass and nobody knows what's happening with oxygenation. We assume it would be affected because like every stressful condition and these changes would affect it, but nobody knows to what extent. But what's good about this, okay, not just to give them a tool to assess, but we have a means to solution basically some supplements which you all did tested in clinic the good scientific background this is our approach we would like to approach uh, space healthcare or space uh, a human health kind of community or people who involved there to collaborate with them and we have everything ready to start to work together we have a test and we have a safe supplements you know this is now question is how we can approach from our medical environment here to the space uh, study projects there in space yeah Excellent. Okay, so uh, we do have a question. Uh, do you regard leaky gut syndrome uh, as contributing to poor peripheral oxygen oxygenation uh, by adding a load from the bowel movement? Yes, because oxygenation, it's essential for every tissue, for every single cell in our body. And the problem with the gut, yes, it's the same because it will be inflammatory changes, not necessarily clinical big manifestation, but could be inflammation in a, a Reduction of oxygenation, hypoxia go uh, together. It's two sides of the same cause, kind of kind of coin. And this is it. They would be there, but nobody measured this. But in clinic on, on our ground, we do know changes in the gut and the changes in inflammation and oxidation. We know this. And we've done study on it, yeah, to, to prove it. Okay. Um, so another uh, question here. Um, traditional way of assessing tissular oxygenation is through venous arterial O2 extraction. How would you provide arterial O2 content? Um, are you correcting for peripheral venous blood O2 content? No, uh, we go to, for- To central. Oh, sorry. Oh, go sorry, sorry. Nope, yeah, go ahead. Started, yeah. You know, it's great. It's a great question. You're right. It, uh, conventionally do arterial blood. Venous is really doesn't give you much information about tissue oxygenation. It's out of the tissue, the blood. We go to capillary blood. Capillary blood, yes, you can. And today it's capillary blood. It's also used like uh, when you can go to arteries, you go to capillary blood. Like uh, in the clinics, it's, it's already FDA approved test and so on, but it's a big machinery, even sometimes compact machinery, but it's not a point of care. You need a kind of machinery and a training. It's, it's, we give something much more convenient. Everybody can do it at home. And this is what we do, it's capillary blood. Excellent. Okay. And that was from, that wasn't my question. I'm not that smart. Uh, that was Diego Garcia. Okay, asking question, that question. So thank you, Diego. Yeah. Uh, very cool. And so there's, there's another question in the chat, but unfortunately we're, we're out of time. 
Uh, so we're going to move on to our next poster. But right. Ivan, thank you so much. And uh, please stay on the chat and in the questions, and you can uh, and keep conversing with people there. Thank so you. So excellent. For hosting, All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. So now it's my honor to turn it over to uh, my esteemed co-host, uh, who will take you the rest of the way today, uh, Alan DeLuna, the president of the board of the American Astronautical Society. Uh, Alan, I turn it over to you, sir. And thank you, Jim. Uh, can you hear well? Yep. I'm clear. Okay, bye, bye, thank bye. you. Interesting things, moving computers around in rooms to rooms to rooms. So thank you for ca carrying me over, Jim. Well, it's time for our next uh, presentation. And it's Venus thrombolytic risk on female astronauts during prolonged spaceflight. And that's by Aurora Brittany Diaz Fernandez. So uh, ladies, let's go ahead and play their presentation. Hello, everybody. My name is Aurora Diaz, and we present a literature review on the topic of Venus thrombotic risk in female astronauts during prolonged spaceflight. We proceed with the goal of advancing the studies that support the health and performance of female astronauts in space. Current knowledge of the risk of thrombosis in female astronauts for long-duration spaceflight is insufficient. Clothing represents a greater risk to the female population in general as oral estrogen is implicated in increased clothing risk. Female astronauts generally prefer combined oral contraceptive pills to induce amenorrhea. The first case of blood clot suffered by an astronaut in space during a mission in the International Space Station was recently reported. The findings show that the risk of thrombosis in female astronauts is a clear concern due to the possible interaction of estrogenic components typical of the female population. Pathophysiology of venous thrombosis was the result of any of three etiological factors. Vascular endothelial damage, blood estasis, and blood hypercoagulability. It is currently recognized that all risk factors for deep vein thrombosis present these pathophysiological factors. Blood hypercoagulability in space is mainly driven by IM concentration. Open and tried into weightlessness after an initial increase in central blood volume, there is an increase in urine and a decrease in freeze, which causes a contraction of intravascular volume, leading to a relative increase in fibrinogen, red blood cells, and platelet levels. On Earth, exogenous estrogens are involved with hypercoagulability. Astronauts can experience endothelial dysfunction for different reasons, such as radiation that induces vascular damage through DNA double strand breakage, oxidative stress, and inflammation could be factors to consider during exploration missions to the Moon and Mars. Alteration of vascular wall pressure, immunological alteration, temperature, hypobaric stress due to decompression, psychosocial stress, age, and alteration of circadian rate are other factors to consider. Many studies have reported an association between oral estrogens and the risk of thromboembolisms. Female astronauts generally opt for the combined oral contraceptive pill to induce amenorrhea, even though long-acting reversible contraceptives have been found to be more effective in suppressing the menstrual cycle. A standard such progestin-only contraceptive don't increase the risk of venous thromboembolisms but injection at very high concentration of proestins can increase the risk of venous thromboembolisms by two to four times. On the other hand, proestin only pills, levonorgestrel IUD, and subcutaneous implant are generally safe contraceptive methods for a woman who has had venous thromboembolisms. And in the case of levonorgestrel IUD, it could be a potential safe option for female astronauts. 
More research is needed to understand how the environment of space can affect the biomechanical behavior of thrombosis and, more broadly, the circulatory system. Because the combined oral contraceptive is the current preferred therapy by female astronauts to stop menstruation during space missions, there may exist an increased risk of developing thromboembolism. Many other such therapies are in use on Earth today, of which potentially safer options could exist for these astronauts, for example, the levonorgestrel IUD. Future studies are suggested to evaluate the various contraceptives used by female astronauts with a potential focus on observations on the relationship between the development of venous thrombosis and the type of contraceptive in use. All right, very interesting. A little deep for me, but very interesting. So, um, Ara, a couple of questions for me as, as we go forward. And uh, the, did you have access to the health records of the astronauts to, to understand the uh, occurrence of venous thrombosis, or are you operating just on, on publicly available data? Yes, uh, well, there exists uh, just one study uh, that I find that I was doing uh, in International Space Station. And just uh, that one study suggests that uh, the oral contraceptive uh, maybe don't have any effects in the health of these women astronauts. But well, as I say, there is just like one study. Uh, as we know, uh, when we do the, some comparisons between, uh, for example, the air, uh, we have like studies that support this, but I think that um, we need like uh, other studies. I don't know if maybe we could do first with animals because I know that it's uh, uh, that we have or it's dangerous uh, maybe for people to do this type of studies. But if can do this or if we can study uh, the type of contraceptive uh, and his effects, for example, and the effects of microgravity and radiation in this organism, maybe uh, we can have like more data. But well, um, this is in relation, in relation with the woman, but yes, uh, we have evidence that um, there are like uh, some people, some astronauts that have uh, an increase, for example, in the, in the internal jugular vein when they are, uh, a lot of time in uh, microgravity. Uh, and there are other studies, for example, they do with uh, in parabolic flights. Uh, they simulated the microgravity of the Earth and they simulated, uh, sorry, they simulated the, micro, the gravity or the hypogravity of the Moon and of the Mars. And they see as well that in these 11 uh, healthy subjects, they see that they have an increase as well of the uh, jugular main pressure. So, well, we have like evidence that, for example, microgravity can induce uh, or can have a, a paper in maybe in the risk of develop uh, these uh, thromboembolism uh, pathology. Okay, and we have a, a question from Bill here. Uh, is venal thrombosis related to the occurrence of PCOS in women astronauts? uh yeah uh okay as i say uh first uh we don't have like so much evidence we don't have so much studies because when i do the research uh, i found like not a lot of literature i just found uh some papers and they were not so related but uh as i say uh, i just found one paper and was not so related to the woman but these papers uh, say that, well, uh, maybe uh, the oral contraceptive can have like a main paper in this thrombotic risk. But uh, we have like other papers that uh, I found it, that they support, for example, the use of IUD of levonorgestrels, uh, of levonorgestrels, uh, like as safe safety options. Uh, because I know that, uh, uh, or I, well, I know that, for example, we need to do like more long studies, 
uh, maybe to know the, the, the effects of the contraceptive pills. So I think that uh, maybe we need to change our, <clears throat> as I say, to do more experiments uh, in, in this way, you know, to find like more safety options uh, to prevent this pathology and to improve the female, the health of these female astronauts. Okay, thank you. And that's all the time we have for, for questions on this one. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can go uh, into the Q&A, Aurora, and there are a couple of other questions there, and you can answer those questions. Okay, thank you very much. They are appropriate. So thank you very much. And uh, interesting uh, study on something that is actually uh, surprisingly timely. So our next presentation is Interest Spacecraft RFID Localization by Jesse Berger. Let's run his poster, please. Today, we will be talking about intra spacecraft RFID localization. My name is Jesse Berger, and I am the chief data scientist on the RFID logistics team here at Johnson Space Center. Start with a general introduction to the problem. Tracking of logistics on space stations is difficult. It is an extremely dense environment full of diverse cargo with metallic obstructions. Combine this with mass, power, and crew limitations that lead to uninstrumented volumes, and the multipath RF reflections become both entirely necessary and uniquely problematic. As for the current Realm flight system, we were initially installed in 2017. We have six embedded Linux readers, two in each module, each with four antennas, eight per module, or 24 in total, and those have read some 6,000 unique RFID tabs over the history of the program, with roughly 3,000 of them being on station at any one time. Most of those tabs are attached to inventory, but some of them are static marker or reference tabs adhered to the walls and surfaces of the vehicle. Ultimately, our goal is to reduce crew time spent searching for items. An actionable resolution is to the rat level, which comprises a two by one meter area. There are roughly 40 such rats that are used for storage on station. Our current latest generation of tools leverage machine learning to do this task. We use both a convolutional neural network, PRFDNet, that does rat classification of frequency response images. We also have a random forest classifier that leverages intuition-based feature engineering on a far smaller data set. They both have their strengths and weaknesses, but taken in aggregate, they give us high confidence, high precision localization, exceeding 80%. We're continuing to improve and iterate on our inferencing tools. Part of this is evaluating other machine learning approaches. We're also researching better ways to segment the problem space and how to ensemble the results from our various models in a way that takes into account their varying technology readiness levels. In support of our algorithms running on the ground, we have the free-flying Ashby robot built by Ames. We have outfitted it with an RFID reader and four RFID tenders for the purpose of expanding the reach of our inventory audits and homing on missing items. A recent test in JPM increased the number of TADs being inventoried in JPM by 500%. Earlier this month, we ran a static inventory audit in PMM, a module conventionally beyond the reach of our RFID antennas. Preliminary data analysis should we're able to increase the PMM inventory audit effectiveness a hundredfold. In addition to autonomous robotics, other hardware solutions are being investigated. Looking back at historical lost item requests, three quarters of the items found in Node 1 were found in one of two gravi zero gravity storage rats. This leads us to develop hardware to instrument specific drawers, but in a way that minimizes mass and power requirements. In summary, we're utilizing machine learning, and in doing so, we realize a generational leap in inferencing performance, and we continue to refine those tools. We're continuing to leverage the Ashby Free Flyer to fill gaps in our hardware infrastructure, and we're also refining our hardware approach to flight readiness to mitigate some of the harder challenges of the problem. Ultimately, we're working to further automate logistics operations with the intent to leave astronauts more time to do science. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, this was actually something that we were working when I had a real job back in 2007 and eight, and we did not have the capabilities that you have today. You, you mentioned machine learning, and uh, so that's an extension of, of AI. Can you talk a little bit more about how that enabled your ability to put together these systems? 
Absolutely. Um, so, you know, this program has been running for a um, little over four years. Uh, the first generation of tools were more um, algorithmic statistical methods um, where we're, you know, using certain features, read rate and RSSI and trying to generate um, kind of XYZ locations. Um, it was about a, a year and a half ago, a little over that, um, that we started leveraging machine learning. We have a huge amount of data, um, 20 to 30 billion rows of readings over the last um, four years. Um, and we have a source of truth, which is the inventory management system um, that's managed by the ISOs uh, and mission control. Uh, inventory storage officers um, and so by joining together those things you know that's kind of a perfect um, use case for using machine learning lots of data and a source of truth um, and so we're able to basically there's a bunch of different approaches to do that but you feed that in and say this set of data means this rack you know this location classification um, and you know that's kind of what kind of drove us that direction and then it's a matter of structuring the data uh to get the right result um uh, and to mitigate all the shortfalls that there exist in machine learning okay and our experience was that the astronauts tended to stuff things in cubby holes and nicks and crannies and stack them in places that you don't normally think of as storage how does your system react to that Absolutely. And that's, uh, you know, there are uh, tools out there that do high accuracy localization, but most of those don't work outside of line of sight. Um, so they're using high, higher frequency bands that as soon as they hit something, you know, it kind of dissipates. And so by the nature of ultra high frequency 900 megahertz RFID, um, we're able to reflect and bounce and get, you know, at about a 25, 30, 35 foot range. Um, and it's often able to uh, penetrate into those storage locations. Now, that being said, there are some rats uh, that are full metal doors um, that uh, are extremely difficult to penetrate. And then that kind of goes into um, the instrumented uh, rack concept, where let's put the antennas inside the rack itself um, so that we can read the contents even when a RF opaque door is closed. OK, and you said you have about 3,000 tags on orbit right now, what kind of criteria are you using to uh, as to what you tag? You, you, you frequently frequently used items, uh, items that not are not frequently used, size, uh, those kinds. Yeah, of now things. nowadays they pretty much tag absolutely everything, um, every piece of food every um usually it's a ziploc bag with tape in it or whatever consumables every cargo transfer bag is tad um and uh now i know that there are some tools and stuff that are not tad um but those have been up there for a while um but in more recent time they've made a kind of a practice to tad uh nearly everything and so um are you still putting on the barcode tags on everything that goes up and the astronauts still having to scan barcodes as they lo unload and load the uh, transport vehicles? Um, I'm trying to remember if they're, I, they, at one time they did use and leverage the handheld RFID reader um, during uh, logistics tasks. Um, I'm not sure if that is still the standard practice, but I don't take my word for it. Um, and so I, I know they have a handheld um, that they've used in the past. Okay, yeah, handheld barcode is what you mentioned, not handheld RFID. Well, it, um, uh, they have a handheld RFID scanner as well. Okay, yeah, um, one of the things the astronauts really did not appreciate was having to barcode read everything that came off of a transport yep. vehicle, especially when it was a shuttle with a few thousand items. Uh, one more question for you, and that is uh, expansion of this to additional modules such as the BIM or the Axios or, or other modules. Will you address that for a moment? Yes, and so that's part of the challenge is we're currently only instrumented in Node 1, US Lab, and Node 2. Um, you know, we're looking to expand into other areas such as particularly um, Node 3, so we can see into PM, uh, PMM. The issue is PMM is not instrumented with power. Um, and so there's a few different limitations there. Um, 
the bid one is true limitations to outfit these things and run the starring for network cables and power and and so on um you know or you know integrating that with the rest of the system um but we're trying to solve these going into the the new gateway lunar vehicle um so we're trying to pre-star those things so that um we've already have that instrumentation there. In addition, you know, leveraging a free flying robot with RFID readers that we can literally put anywhere, which we just did two weeks ago, where we moved it into PMM, a place that we have no power that we can't, uh, or we have no accessible power. Um, and we're able to, you know, do a, a perch inventory audit in a place that is, you know, completely uninstrumented. So that helps kind of expand our reach um, on station. Very interesting, Jesse, and very, uh very descriptive and very complete explanation. So thank you very much. I appreciate thank it you. being an old shuttle hugger. So um, Absolutely. let's go then off I'll to- answer the questions on Q&A. Yeah, thank we you. can answer the questions on Q&A. And thank you guys for uh, putting in the questions. Put them in a little earlier, folks, so we can get to them you know, in front of any, any of my questions, and we will try to do that. So our, our next uh, presentation is ultra code gases in shuttle potentials on the ISS, Progress in Science Module 3, SM3, of the Cold Atom Lab, which is CAL. And this is uh, Joseph Murphy. So let's play his presentation, please. Hi, I'm Joe Murphy. I'm a postdoc in Nathan Lundblad's group at Bates College in Lewiston, Maine. And I'm going to tell you about research we've been doing in collaboration with Dave Aveline at JPL using the cold atom lab aboard the ISS. Cold atoms are physically interesting because when you get a gas of, ad of atoms sufficiently cold, it can exhibit quantum properties on a macroscopic scale. One such quantum state of matter is called a Bose-Einstein condensate, or BEC. And a productive vein of research over the past decade in BECs has been creating BECs of interesting shapes. And the topology and the geometry of these shapes affects the properties of the resulting condensate. In SM3, we're going to specifically look at shell-shaped condensates or bubble-shaped condensates. Now the potentials, which is to say the molds that are used to create these shells have been successfully created on Earth. But when you introduce atoms into the potentials, they are all sagged to one side by the effects of Earth's gravity. A particularly elegant way to overcome this problem is by performing the experiments in the microgravity environment aboard the space station. Science Module 3 is a chip-based device. The atoms start in a vacuum chamber glass cell and are trapped using the electromagnetic fields created by wires on a microchip that's installed on one side of the glass cell. In addition to lasers and radio and microwave fields. The conditions that are ideal for creating and cooling the condensate are not ideal for creating the bubble. And so the first thing we do is we move the atoms from where they are initially cooled to the center of the chamber. There we apply an additional radio frequency ramp, which creates the bubble potential. The final frequency of that ramp determines the size of the bubble with higher frequencies corresponding to larger bubbles. A sample of this data taken as absorption images is shown at the bottom of the center column. On SM3 we're going to also use the techniques of Bragg spectroscopy to analyze the momentum distribution of the cloud. In Bragg spectroscopy, two counterpropagating lasers are shone upon the cloud, and the atoms in the cloud are ejected based on what their momentum state is. 
if we shine the lasers on the cloud and then wait for a few milliseconds before taking the image, the resulting image will contain several distributions of atoms as shown in the inset image. The relative population of each of these clouds correspond to the initial momentum distribution of the condensate. And in this way, we'll be able to dis differentiate between ultra, just very cold atoms and a true condensate. Those who are interested in this research can read further in the articles that I've listed here. And I'd like to conclude by thanking our collaborators at JPL who have helped us set up this experiment and take the data. And to thanks to NASA for providing the funding. Thank you. Joseph, thank you very much. Uh, if you can activate, there we go. So short of getting into a educational opportunity for you to teach me a little more about atomic structure. Um, please help us understand the importance of understanding the energy at different shell levels of uh, atomic structure. So uh, I think what's particularly interesting about these topologies is that um, they're expected to exhibit different types of vortex behavior, for example. So if you have this shell and you spin the, the fluid a little bit, how those vort vortices are formed and how they interact with each other changes based on the shape of the potential that you contain them in. Um, additionally, uh, the way the shell uh, breathes, for example, also changes based on its dimension. And so those are directions we'd like to hopefully eventually pursue. Okay. So um, have you found a redshift in the spectra of energy transitions within a hydrogen BEC as reported in an MIT study some 26 years ago? I should specify uh, that the BECs we're looking at and the, the ultra cold clouds that we're looking at are made exclusively of rubidium. Um, the system also has capabilities for uh, performing experiments with potassium, but we, we haven't looked at hydrogen. Getting the uh, CAL to the station was a, a big deal. It, it took a while to get there. It took a while for us to be ready. But um, amazing science is coming out of it. Help us understand what the CAL is and why it's important to us. So uh, the Cold Atom Laboratory, or CAL, is a, a um, ultra-cold atomic physics ex experiment that's running on the space station. Um, one of the reasons that it's so to begin with, this is this is one of the early quantum science platforms that is is being run in space, and what makes it really unique is that it is one of the first atomic physics experiments that is a user facility. So most atomic physicists are used to experiments that where they have their own lab and um, it's 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 their own space, um, and this is a one of the first times where you have multiple groups across the world uh, participating in an experiment and sharing a piece of equipment. So it's, it's a learning experience in that way as well. Learning how to operate in a different kind of environment is sometimes a shock to those who usually have their entire world built around them. So that's, that's <laughs> Very much so. So what is your position in the CAL? Are you a, a CAL facility operator or are you a researcher? I'm a postdoctoral postdoctoral researcher at Bates <laughs> College in Maine. Okay, so, so you are a user of the Code Atom Lab. I'm I'm part of one of the user groups. That's correct. So you have not had the time to get set in your ways of having complete authority and dominion over a, <laughs> over a lab, and you're used to working in a, a collaborative environment. That's right. I'm I'm used to taking orders. Oh, all right. So uh, how has the uh, distributed uh, work environment that COVID has driven upon us, how has that affected uh, y'all's work? 
Um, so I actually joined the project last July. So that was really the thick of COVID. So I wasn't present for the work before that. However, I've, I've heard stories. And one of the nice things is that the instrument has been operated the entire time. So it hasn't um, had a significant outage of science at any point. Uh, I know my predecessor in this position was able to travel to JPL and be there when the instrument was taking data for our project. And that is something that has changed. I have remained in Maine for the duration, um, but the science has continued unabated. All right, Joseph, thank you very much. I think we answered the questions in the uh, Q&A, but you can jump in and see if we missed one or two. Great, thank you. And uh, very interesting stuff that uh, I, I'll pretend I understood. <laughs> so next is uh, optimum growth. Efficient fertilizers are used for growing extra dwarf pak choy on the International Space Station. And this is with Margaret Hitt. Margaret, uh, we're gonna run your presentation. Hello, we are the Dow High Space Farmers, representing Optimum Goof, efficient fertilizer use for growing extra dwarf bok choy on the ISS. NASA scientists are getting closer to figuring out the optimum growing conditions for leafy grain vegetables on the ISS ever since the first ISS grown lettuce was consumed on board on August 2015. A NASA vegetable production system named Veggie was used along with plant pillows that contain calcined clay mixed with 1868 controlled release fertilizer. While this type of growing media has the needed water holding capacity and essential nutrient uptake, the effects of different fertilizer quantity and release rates on plant yield and nutrient content are yet to be determined. Our ISS simulated experiments tested six different fertilizer treatments to obtain optimum growth of extra bok choy plants and long-term space missions. We used the 1868 control release fertilizer in three quantities, five, 10, and 15 grams, and two release rates. T70 and T100. 10 gram T70 as a control group. T70 and T100 are the nutrient release rates, which gradually release 85% of nutrients over 70 and 100 days respectively. Except for microgravity, we use simulated NASA growth chambers and growth media to mimic growing conditions and harvest scenarios on the ISS, including 28-day harvest and 56-day continuous harvest. Plant yield data from nine growth chambers were collected, including four from other schools in the Growing Beyond Earth program. Our on-site data also included substrate leachate analysis, light intensity, and microbial analysis. Nutrient analysis for plants and growing media were done by professional lab. Our experiment results show that between two fertilizer release rates, T100 rendered 2.8 times less total edible biomass in both harvests than T70. Among three fertilizer quantities, using 15 gram attained the lowest overall growth rate and lowest nutrient use efficiency. The T100 and 15 gram fertilizer uses are not considered efficient. In contrast, using five and 10 grams of T70 rendered first and second highest in overall growth rate as well as nutrient use efficiency. Let's compare five and 10 gram T70 in terms of chemical changes in growing media and nutrient content in plants. In terms of chemical changes in the growing media, the average electrical conductivity value of the growing media with 10 grams of T70 increased 3.46 times as much as the media with 5 grams. This indicates that there were more fertilizer salts left in the 10 gram substrate that were not used up by the plant. As the plant yield and nutrient use efficiency are also lower under 10 grams of T70 than 5 grams, using 10 grams of T70 thus seems counterproductive. In terms of changes in pre-plant nutrients in growing media, there were no significant increases in 10 grams of T70, except 52.5% more pre-plant phosphate compared to the 5 grams of T70. This resulted in a lower increase in cation exchange capacity and thus rendered significantly lower nutrient uptake than 5 grams of T70 did, including a 43.2% less nutrient uptake in potassium, 568 in magnesium, and 55.5 in calcium. Our findings agrees with recent fertilizer research. Exceptional soil phosphate could cause failure in nutrient absorption. Lastly, our extra-dose bok choy grown in five grams of T70 media had a similar on-orbit plant nutrient profile as proposed by Dr. Massa. That is, higher nutrient concentration of potassium, magnesium, and calcium, but lower concentrations of iron. Compared to the 10 grams of T70, the 5 grams of T70 rendered 3.57% more in potassium, 2.72% more in magnesium, 
and 3.05% more in calcium and 16.5% less in iron. In summary, the release rate of T100 seems too slow for the 28 and 56 day harvests. And while the T70 release rate seems just right, using 10 grams of it could be detrimental to exeter or pak choy. Some of our plants under the 10 gram treatment showed symptoms of calcium deficiency, suffered from bacterial infection, and eventually did not last. In contrast, under 5 grams of T70 treatment, exodorf bok choy plants were highly productive and resilient, as the efficiency of 5 grams of T70 was not affected by different microbial loads or light intensities. In conclusion, our study identifies using 5 grams of 18.6A controlled release fertilizer in T70 as the most efficient fertilizer to attain optimum growth of exodorf bok choy on board the ISS. It thus helps add information to current space botany research and improve space agriculture capacities to save by astronauts' health and long-term space missions. Thank you for your time. All right, and thank you. Thank you. So um, we have a question here that says, uh, what kind of soil is used for space agriculture? What kind of growth media, media did you have? All right, so we use the soil that um, the scientists at NASA do. So it's a calcined clay, and the fertilizer that we used is an 1868 NPK controlled release fertilizer. So it will eventually release nutrients as the days go on. Okay, and you said you did this in simulated microgravity. Uh, what was, how did you, you simulate the microgravity? What was the mechanism by which you did that? So although our experiments did not simulate microgravity directly, we used materials and chambers that mimic growing conditions on board the ISS. The growing mixes are the same used in the NASA plant pillows, and the grow chambers are miniature of the high-tech ones used on the ISS called advanced plant habitat. And finally, the average chamber temperature and humidity measures are also similar to those on the ISS. All right, so you got everything except the microgravity that everything could <laughs> yeah, possibly yeah. Yes. Now you said you used a, a 1868? Yes, so- Fertilizer, eight... okay. So have you addressed creating your own uh, specialized fertilizer or is NASA using, looking at using their own specialized fertilizer as opposed to an off the shelf type fertilizer for use, getting the best nutrients in the right concentrations? Well, we, since we're high school students, we couldn't necessarily um, create our own fertilizer, but that would be something we could look into. But what we did instead was look at the quantity of fertilizer that we had. So we had the quantity of five grams of fertilizer compared to the 10 grams of fertilizer. So the amount of nutrients that are in the soil will be different. And that's what we compared. Okay. And um, so you ran your control side by side with the um, the experiment so that you had your control data in a very uh, known environment? Yes, so we had our um, plants in this growth chamber. And since we were virtual, we each had a growth chamber that we used. And inside the growth chamber was three plants using the control um, fertilizer, which was 10 grams, and another three plants using the five grams of fertilizer. Yeah, and we, we did this twice. We did we had a spring trial and a summer trial, each with 30 samples. And all of these 30 samples all had randomized position of the plant pots between the control and the experimental. So they would get to experience different light intensities and if other factors were involved in the study. Yep, and then we also were able to collaborate with other schools. Um, those included Jefferson Middle School from Michigan, Pasic Valley Regional High School from New Jersey, Olin Tinji STEM School from Ohio and Clara Barton High School from New York. And these four schools did a similar experiment to ours and we were able to, through GBE, we were able to, um, yeah, uh, collaborate with them with our data. Collaboration is, is really great and very important. <laughs> yeah. And, and working together uh, gets you much, much further. So you did pack choy. Mm -hmm. Did you harvest it? Did it taste good? <laughs> well, um, since we wanted to have our data um, kind of set, we didn't, we weren't able to eat our plants because that would have messed with our data. So unfortunately we didn't get to try it, but um, in previous experiments that we've done like two years ago, we've 
we had tried the taste of Exeter Fat Choy, and the consensus was that it's very juicy. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, juicy plant. Mm -hmm. All right, wonderful. So thank you all very much. This has been a tremendous uh, presentation from a high, group of high school students. Yeah. Um, and, and, oh. Go ahead. We would like to thank um, GBE and our Midland community members for um, sponsoring us and helping us along the way. We're very grateful. Well, thank you guys. Yeah. And this is a proven one of the things we try to do in the ISS R&D conference technical sessions is when we have student developed projects, which are equivalent or even better than some of the professional developed projects, we try to mainstream them and put them in the regular presentations instead of just having a, a side bar student competition. So you guys you guys did great and we really appreciate it. Yes, have a good day. Thank you. Now it's time to move to our next uh, session called Energy Efficient and Qu Fast Quantum Key Distribution System for Cloud Connected CubeStats by Yumit Sami. Play his poster, please. Hello and welcome to ISS 2021 Virtual Conference. In this poster session, we would like to tell you about our ongoing research, uh, which uh, has to do with energy speed and uh, ultra secure data transmission uh, in telecom networks, as well as uh, CubeSats. Uh, as you can see in, uh, in the left side of the uh, drawing, uh, there exists uh, an optical a network, and this is strictly an optical network where we have uh, routers uh, installed in, in the physical optical infrastructure uh, of the telecom system. Uh, so for instance, in this case, we have one router uh, in California, you know, uh, connected to another router in New York. Uh, because this is a, a fiber optic channel and the routers uh, are quantum uh, devices, uh, they provide 100% uh, uh, fidelity uh, and uh, security of the data going back and forth on, on this channel. Um, so there's no way uh, for an intruder to tap into this uh, fiber optic cable and copy those streams of ones and zeros passing by. Whereas today, in classical uh, uh, telecom networks, uh, one can easily do that and break into the system uh, they are targeting. So therefore, by definition, QKD is, uh, is, uh, eliminates, it, eliminates the possibility of cyber crime. Uh, alternatively, if this network, uh, fiber network, is not available between California and New York, one can easily install, um, uh, deploy um, a CubeSat in Leo region of the or orbit away from the Earth and enable uh, the same communication between the QKD one in California and the QKD router two in New York. Uh, inside of this CubeSat, uh, we would, you know, essentially deploy the same exact router in a different form factor to enable uh, the exchange of quantum uh, information. Inside the router itself, we are introducing two key innovations. One is the the quantum entanglement. Uh, essentially, what we are doing, uh, we are encoding information and the, uh, the entangled uh, uh, states of photons. And this uh, is assured by the uh, uh, Bell's inequality law and uh, uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle that the content uh, passing on this channel, uh, whether if it's free optic uh, over space or fiber optic cannot be intruded uh, or intercepted. The second uh, key concept we're introducing is the compression chip. Uh, which can be very uh, useful uh, in, in cases where there is a, a significant energy and distance constraint, such as satellite systems. Satellites have limited solar power uh, and they operate very remotely from, away, uh, from Earth. Therefore, the speed and the distance uh, of the data they send back and forth uh, is, uh, is not uh, uh, high volume uh, or, or could be as twice as... Uh, uh, effective. If you could build a unique compression chip that does that, we'll be able to push twice the data with half the energy consumption. So uh, another key concept that we are doing uh, or, or researching in, in, uh, in this proposal is the integration of this uh, optical network I've described on the left side into the existing infrastructure of the internet today, which we describe on the right side of the 
of the drawing. Uh, these routers uh, at each endpoint within the internet generate a unique quantum key, which call them, uh, we call them Q keys, which is nothing more than streams of ones and zeros traveling over a, a TCP IP network. The unique thing about this Q keys is that it represents essentially the signature of the traffic they have traveled in the optical network. So it's not just a signature, but also the, it represents the history of, the, of that transmission. Once this QQ is reached to the data center, we use a unique software to generate unique quantum certificates, which we then push through the internet into edge devices or, or systems where they have client uh, uh, connectivity. With all the old requirement, all, the only requirement for that is is an IP address. So uh, things like mission critical data and applications running in the cloud, such as AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud, is one area we can secure those. Uh, uh, applications in, in sec unsecure uh, public environments. Alternatively, we can deploy them into uh, IoT devices such as solar farms, you know, uh, wind turbines. These are like energy devices where there's streams of ones and zeros going back and forth, or you need to remotely control these uh, mission critical devices in the field. Um, you know, the uh, other alternative is, uh, of course, is the uh, deployment of certificates into the uh, high volume uh, uh, data applications like video streaming, where you wanna make sure you have confiden uh, confidential transmission of video and, um, and, uh, and voice uh, between two uh, parties. Uh, I'll stop there. And uh, if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to drop me an email. My uh, contact information is provided below. Thank you for your time. Have a good day. Thank you, Yumit. Uh, go ahead and activate things there. Okay. Um, so okay. So uh, waiting for some questions to come out of the Q and A. And uh, so I, I have a, a couple. Um, just by the poster graphics, it looked like you were either in an optical transmission system or a a wired transmission system. Is that a in a is that a wrong assumption? Are no, you so, does, does this work in an RF system? So the RF extension is uh, as we consider that as a classical network, uh, whether if it's a quark cable or RF. Uh, as long as ones and zeros are transmitted, uh, we consider that classical communication. Uh, and the optical part is of course where the light source, a photon, the entangled photon sources travel, and that, that those are strictly. Uh, the network I try to describe on the left side of the drawing, uh, that is 100% uh, optical, but not limited to fiber, of course. You can have uh, laser comp communication from a CubeSat uh, down to a base station, uh, which would be photonic uh, uh, communication, and that would ensure the, the security of the transmission as well. Okay, I would anticipate that the dominant transmission methodology over the next little while is going to remain RF. So have you tested this system, uh, your key system in an on-orbit RF type environment? No, we have not looked into RF uh, yet. Uh, you know, uh, that hopefully will be the one of, one of our goals uh, in, in the future. Things like uh, uh, 5G networks, uh, things of that nature, uh, uh, where they have uh, RF-based uh, uh, kind of medium uh, electromagnetic waves uh, for propagating. The challenge with the RF is, is that um, you, you, uh, you can ensure the uh, confidentiality of the data uh, on RF uh, uh, in, in free air, uh, free space, uh, just by streams of ones and zeros. You need a more advanced algorithms um, to do that. And we haven't really kind of uh, gone that far, but that's something in the, in the research agenda for sure to uh, explore its, its potential. So what is the applicability of this system in CubeSats as you, you titled it? So uh, for CubeSat, I mean, how does it relate to CubeSat? Is that your yes, question? Yes, yes. Okay, so, we, uh, so there are cases where we cannot deploy, uh, you know, these routers uh, from uh, in, in fiber optic networks. Uh, sometimes exist, let's say you wanna build, establish a connection between California and New York, and if the fiber channel, uh, the long haul backend fiber network of the US is not uh, 
cannot be leased or maybe it's not available. In that situation, you can deploy the same router into a, a, a CubeSat size, uh, uh, you know, satellite uh, in, into the Leo orbit. And, and you would have two base stations in California and New York to establish the same communication channel, again, over, over a, a laser con uh, to, to, to distribute the, uh, the quantum states without the possibility of uh, uh, interception. And one last question, uh, what is the essential distinction between conventional packets and qubits? I don't know what that question means, okay, but uh, I read it anyway. Yeah, sure. I mean, the conventional packets is, is essentially datagrams, uh, uh, you know, traveling uh, on the internet. This was uh, an invention in uh, with DOD, uh, packet switching technology called ARPANET projects in 1969, 50 years ago, they invented this uh, packet technology. Today's uh, internet is still based on the same packet uh, switching technology that they're referring to. Uh, with qubits, uh, you are essentially adding new frames to those same datagrams traveling on the internet, uh, on the digital side. On the optical side, it is not even packet-based technology. It's a completely different way of encoding information. And that's why it's not hackable when it's uh, traveling on, on the fiber. Yeah. So All right. It relates to, to the packet technology of the internet, but it's it's kind of its evolution, I would say. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you very much. This is a, sure. a very different discussion for us. It's uh, definitely interesting. So you can go into the Q&A and see if there's another question or two that were directed towards you that may or may not be appropriate. So you answer them as you see fit uh, on the Q&A system. And we're gonna move over to our next uh, presentation poster and that is the use of the ISS vacuum and zero gravity environment for determining small satellites, deployable structures, parameters. This is by Lorenzo, Lorenzo Guavindo Montavani. So let's pay his presentation, please. Hello, my name is Lorenzo Mantovani, and today I will present to you the poster entitled The Use of the ISS Vacuum and Zero Gravity Environment for Determining Small Satellite Deployable Structures Parameters. In the introduction, we explain that the adoption of small satellites is increasing and some of their applications require an Accurate Attitude and Determination Control System, or ADCS. In this trend, these small satellites are also requiring more power, hence using larger solar panels. Additionally, small satellites usually employ deployable structures to increase their capabilities. These deployable structures are called booms and are used to position instruments and equipment away from the satellite. However, these larger solar panels and deployable booms can present significant flexibility, introducing vibrations in the system and degrading the ADCS performance. Also, deployable structures commonly do not have latching systems to lock their final positions after deployment, introducing more vibrations in the system. Some studies aim to mitigate these problems with a complete and accurate model of these effects, which requires structural parameters and parameters of their deployable mechanisms. These parameters can be determined experimentally, but experiments here on Earth have the influence of both gravity and atmosphere, and can differ from the parameters in the space. While the gravity influence can be mitigated with the use of a gravity offload system, not all systems fit such an equipment. Also, the gravity offload system must be properly designed, so they do not introduce any extra dynamics in the system. The atmospheric influence, on the other hand, can be mitigated using vacuum chambers, but they are not vastly available or even cheap. One satellite that has flexible non-matching booms is the Spark CubeSat, which stands for Scintillation Predictions Observation Research Task, being developed in partnership between NASA and the Brazilian Space Agency, and shown in Figure 1. We conduct experiments with sports booms to obtain the necessary parameters, but we know they are not ideal due to gravity and atmosphere influence. 
Hence, in the Objectives section, we propose to use the ISS Vacuum and Zero Gravity environment to perform experiments with flexible deployable structures and compare the obtained parameters in space with the ones obtained on Earth. Then, some correction values can be obtained to be used not only on current missions, but also for other missions in the future. In methodology, we explain the exp experiments conducted with sports booms here on Earth. In these experiments, we recorded the deployment of the booms and used it to calibrate the necessary parameters, so the model could match the experimental results. The experimental procedure and the results obtained were already submitted to a journal and are currently under review. Figure 2 shows one of the sports booms being recorded during the experiment and figure 3a shows some of the frames recorded. On the right, figure 3b shows the match between the experiment curve and results obtained with the model with calibrated parameters. So, we suggest to use a similar technique abroad the ISS, with the advantage of mitigating both the gravity and atmosphere influence. In the final remarks, we discuss the success of our experiment to obtain the necessary parameters to fit our models, and again explain that these parameters are not ideal. The use of the ISS environment could provide some correction values for experiments conducted here on Earth and benefit several current and future missions. Then, in acknowledgments, we thank the grants provided by both CAPES and FAPESP. Lastly, we present this work references. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Uh, really appreciate that, Lorenzo. So this is purely right now a earthbound uh, project. Is that my correct interpretation? Yes, the, the experiment, we only performed it on Earth. And some of our objectives is try to validate our results once the satellite is in orbit. Do you believe that there would be adequate customer demand for developing the facility payload capabilities to be able to do this on ISS? Yes, so our idea is that we have a market that is uh, growing. And this market sometimes requires larger structures, um, such as solar solar panels, foldable solar panels, and booms in general. And maybe we uh, maybe we'll be required to have this this uh, better understanding of these effects of both gravity and atmosphere, and even the, the temperature in these parameters. Have you developed? a good explanation of uh, what kind of uh, optical systems and measurements and control systems you would need to be able to do this on the ISS? Yes. So uh, first we need to understand our system because each system will need different parameters, but we usually can use high-speed cameras with high frame rates to record the deployment of these structures. Um, but some aspects such as frequency, acquisition, resolution, and recording time, it will depend on each experiment. Okay, so there's some question out there about, and to those of us that are used to working in the systems, we understand what a boom is, but uh, that may be not intuitively obvious to some of our folks. Help us understand what you mean by boom and the different kinds of configurations you might find useful to be tested on orbit in the ISS before it's actually done in real life. Well, okay, so booms are uh, structures that we use to position things away from satellite and they are usually deployable. So the, these structures are initially positioned close to satellite and we deploy it and position things away from satellite. And the booms we showed in the poster they are one type of booms, and you can have several types of booms, especially on, on small satellites, like self-deployable booms that use the, 
structure the its own structure energy to the fly itself and then we start to get into more complex designs that you can have several booms uh, together to like foldable booms and you can use that for several different uh, mission objectives like deploy uh, instruments antennas solar arrays um, well everything So uh, again, what besides boom deployment do you think would be useful to test on orbit as opposed to just waiting until you deploy a CubeSat and find out that it works or doesn't? What besides deployable booms? Okay, uh, structures in general that you need to, to deploy. For example, uh, if you are looking for solar sails, that would be an interesting environment to test them because they are usually real lightweight and the gravity can influence them significantly so using the uh, an atmosphere also so I, I think that it would be beneficial to test this uh, solar sails in space also solar cells is a really interesting idea because there's been some solar cell cubesats that have been deployed and the solar cell deployment did not operate properly so uh, you may be on, on something there. That's pretty interesting. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lorenzo. Uh, we're thank out you. of our time here. And there are a couple of questions in there, but I think that we answered them. But again, go and look at the Q&A and determine if, you, uh, if we missed something that uh, we shouldn't have missed. Sure, thank you. All right, so to everybody else, or everybody, including Lorenzo, um, thank you. That is the, uh, concludes our poster sessions and concludes the entire technical session element of the 2021 ISS R&D conference. Uh, thank you to our authors and presenters, and thanks for all of you that joined in these past three days. There have been a few questions every day about uh, whether the uh, recordings will be available, and those recordings uh, watch our uh, AASastronautical.org, that's astronautical.org website, and when they are available, we'll put something there. Also, we'll put something there that leads you to the uh, online program. If you go to the online program, you will be able to access every presentation, all the five minute presentations. And for the regular presentations, you'll get the full 20 minute presentations from the online program. So we'll put the address for that on our website at some point in the next uh, week or so. So we thank everybody who participated. We'd like to thank all of our sponsors, and that is the Boeing Company, this year's ISS Research and Development Conference Platinum Sponsor. They've done that for the past nine years. This is number 10, I think. Airbus, KBR, Lidos, Northrop Grumman, Sierra Space, Space Tango, Teledyne Brown Engineering, the Engineering and Innovation Technology Development Team at the University of Alabama. And thanks to our exhibitors during the plenary sessions. Jacobs, Oceaneering, and Tech Shop. And on behalf of the American Astronautical Society, NASA, and CASIS, thank you for attending this event. Please plan on bringing, being, uh, bringing, bringing yourself and bring your stuff to the 2022 ISS R&D Conference. Right now, we fully expect that to be face-to-face -face live in Washington, D.C., July 25th through 28th. Watch the issconference.org, that's issconference.org website for details. Our last conference that we had in DC was a tremendous success. Uh, not only was it uh, fun, but it was very informative. And also we hope to see you at our Von Braun Memorial Symposium coming up October 12th through 14th. Again, visit astronautical.org for full information. And a little side plug for that, we are going to open up our a system for university and college student poster competitions. We do have a university and college student poster competition that's open to any university or college student, not only in the United States, but internationally. We have had international winners in that contest. Again, watch our website and you will see the announcements for that. So I think that's all for us. Thank you and time for AAS to sign off. Good night. <laughs>